<clears throat> uh, good afternoon and welcome to the September 24th, uh, 2019 Board of County Commissioners meeting here in Pinellas County. Um, again, um, we haven't done this for a while and it's actually in our agenda to do a roll call, but instead I'll have each person introduce themselves because we have someone new today. Um, so we'll start with you, Ken. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Ken Welch representing the mighty 7th District. <laughs> oh, Kathleen Peters representing um, District 6. Good afternoon, Charlie Justice, District 3, Countywide. Uh, Karen Seal. Actual White County Attorney. Patrick District 2. And you? Who are Oops, you? We skipped you. I'm Barry Burton. I'm the County <laughs> Administrator. <laughs> uh, Dave Eggers, uh, Pinellas County Commission, District 4, at the other end of the county. Commissioner Welk. Good morning I, or afternoon. I'm Commissioner Long and I represent the entire county, District 1. And I'm Jeanette Phillips. I'm here for the Clerk of Court and Comptroller's Office. Yeah, welcome. Welcome. Good, Good to, to your first you. meeting Thank you. with us. <laughs> okay, today um, our invocation <clears throat> is um, being led by the Associate Pastor Gina Godfrey with the Family Faith Family Outreach Church in Clearwater. Um, the uh, Pastor Sherry Nicholson was um, is ill, was a, unable to yes. be with us, and so we Hello. welcome you. And yes. please stand for the invocation, and thereafter the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Commissioner Eggers. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence being here, just wisdom on everyone that sits on the board over every issue with the budget and everything that concerns us in this county and everything may you get the glory today and wisdom on each and every person and peace and grace and joy today <laughs> and we thank you in all that we ask today in the precious name of jesus amen amen, amen. 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 thank you i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And next I will come um, down for some presentations and proclamations. Our first item is a proclamation for the 2020 census. And I'd like to ask Constance Hill, Partnership Specialist, the Atlanta Regional Census Center with the U.S. Census Bureau to come forward. Do you have anyone else with you today? Okay. Thank you. The Constitution of the United States mandates a headcount every 10 years of everyone residing in all 50 states and territories. Accurate census information is critical to the planning for future growth, development, and the social needs of Pinellas County. The purpose of the Complete Count Committee is to raise awareness of the importance of Census 2020 by reaching out to undercounted groups and encourage participation in the census. A complete count ensures accurate census data, which provides information critical for government programs, policies, and decision makings. This includes federal representation <coughs> and funding of programs such as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance, Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers, Children's Health Insurance, and Low Income Home Energy Assistance. I also know that we use a lot of the data in our transportation planning, in our um, land use planning, and so on. Eight subcommittees have been established as part of the Census 2020 Complete Count Committee. They are business, city county coordination, civic and multicultural, education, youth and age friendly, faith based, housing, public information, and undercount. Each subcommittee will be chaired by a trusted voice in the community, a liaison chosen by the subcommittee chair and staffed by members of the community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that Pinellas County fully supports the goal of the U.S. Census 
to ensure an accurate count of all residents of Pinellas County, the state of Florida, and the United States. Would you like to say a few words? Yes. Just let me say that it has been a pleasure working with Pinellas County. And I guess I, I really need to name check a couple of people. <laughs> Corey Gray, your liaison, and Josh Boatwright, your marketing project coordinator. They have been fantastic to work with. And if you haven't been to your website recently, you need to go. We are using it and we are telling all other counties that this is the way you're supposed <laughs> to do it. So they have been great. Right it has been fantastic. <laughs> that being said, on behalf of the United States Census Bureau and the Atlanta Regional Census Center, I thank you very much for this proclamation. Well, thank you so much for what you're doing and your leadership efforts, and thank you for the compliments. I know um, our staff has been working very hard to make sure we get out good information. And um, Commissioner Welch, would you like to add anything to this uh, since Connie you're involved? Said, Connie has said it all. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the appointment to that committee. Uh, Josh and Corey and Renee uh, and, and Darlena have done a fantastic job. And we have, as you said, those sub subcommittees are already working. Each has a chair and a liaison, uh, and they're already working to make sure we have a complete count starting in March. It'll be the first digital online response, so that's different for a lot of folks. But the partnership with the Bureau has been fantastic. So thank you for being here today. And I should have asked you to come down, so instead I think we'll focus the picture so we can get you included. Well, I was going to see if we can get Josh and Corey and Renee up. And okay, well, why don't you? Okay. Looks good on you. <laughs> That's what I heard. is National Fire Prevention Week proclamation, and I'd like to ask um, our own Craig Hare, Division Director for EMS and Fire Administration, and Chief Brett Schott, Schott Ladder, you're going to have to help me with that, from the Pinellas Park Fire Department to join me at the podium. Would you mind pronouncing your name? Schlatterer. Schlatterer. Yeah, see? <laughs> That's I, close. Sort of. <laughs> I apologize. Um, the, hi, Craig. Hey, How are you? Good to see you, ma'am. You too. Thank you. The 2019 Fire Prevention Week theme, Not Every Hero Wears a Cape, Plan and Practice Your Escape. A hero can be someone who takes small but important actions to keep themselves and those around them safe from fire. In a typical home fire, you may have as little as one to two minutes to escape safely from the time the smoke <coughs> alarm sounds. Plan ahead for your escape. Make your home escape plan and practice today. Escape planning and practice can help you make the most of the time you have, giving everyone enough time to get out. It is an opportunity for all of us to reflect on the dedicated efforts of our fire rescue personnel who keep us safe every day. Pinellas County recognizes our partnership with municipal fire departments and fire districts that provide fire suppression and rescue to over 970,000 residents of Pinellas County. 
The high level of skill and professionalism of our emergency fire dispatchers, firefighters, fire marshals, and inspectors have enabled the fire rescue system to attain excellence in fire prevention and community education. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that the week of October 6th to October 12th, 2019, be recognized as National Fire Prevention Week. I'll start with you. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, in this proclamation, something to keep in mind is there's more and more chemicals and more and more plastics in our homes, and so they burn faster and hotter, and that's why I really don't try to fight the fire. Get out, call 911, and uh, uh, let the professionals come and, and put out the fire. Rather deal with your belongings than your life. And those nox noxious fumes now, firefighters are on air uh, with their uh, air packs almost continuously, and even after the fire is put out because of all the fumes. So just something to keep in mind. Chief? Yeah, just uh, want to make sure to reiterate, everybody have an escape plan for your family and your home. Uh, it, it just can't, even, can't say it enough on how important that is. Two means for everybody to get out, two escape routes for everybody to get out. Uh, and have a meeting place outside the home where you're gonna meet with each other. When we arrive on scene, we need to know if everybody's out of the house, and so it's very important to make sure that you have a place to meet, uh, and everybody just make an escape plan early. Be ready. If things happen. Don't try to put the fire out yourself. Just get out of the house. We'll be there. Thank you for what um, you and your fellow um, firefighters and all the personnel on the fire system do to keep us all safe every day. We really do appreciate it. So, and I noticed your mayor's here. Would you like to come up and be part of the picture? Okay. All right, commissioners. This feels better, Dave. <laughs> And next is one of um, our most prestigious um, awards that we do during the year. And this is our 2019 Pinellas County Fire Professionals of the Year Award. So today we honor the recipients of the 2019 Pinellas County Fire Professional of the Year Awards. These awards are given to those who go above and beyond the call of duty when providing professional fire services to the community and to the members of the fire service. We'd like to play a video that gives you a brief description of the type of work that is performed by these caring individuals and why they were chosen to be this year's winners. All of Pinellas County fire professionals dedicate their careers to public safety and saving lives. Each year, the Board of County Commissioners recognizes this work by naming the Pinellas County Fire Professionals of the Year. This group's efforts stood out in 2019 because of their outstanding work on the job. His knack for listening to patient needs and dedication to compassionate care earned Fire Medic Alan Ahern the title of Fire Professional of the Year. This 31-year veteran has spent the last 12 years answering calls on the beach with Treasure Island Fire Rescue. A very busy day it can be lots of medical calls. Some calls last for hours. Uh, a house fire, you, you could be there for six or eight hours. And then uh, water rescues. Uh, people get out past the sandbar and get in trouble. Ahern's approach to the job is treating everyone he comes across with dignity. He's known for his care of homeless patients, many who need help treating serious illnesses and addiction issues. Everybody is responsible to take action when they see somebody in need. 
do one thing for one person, it will make a difference for that person, and it will make a difference for you. Nicole McKeague's constant professionalism with collars on the line is why she is 2019's Emergency Fire Dispatcher of the Year. Her knowledge of standard operating procedures and ability to stay calm makes her an asset in the regional 911 center. And Nicole says she starts each shift with one major motivation. Helping people. It's, you know, it can be routine, but then it changes and every call is different and you get those certain calls that just touch you and remind you why you're doing it. 911, what is the address of the emergency? After 12 and a half years taking emergency calls, she's faced plenty of difficult scenarios. I want us to be the best that we can be. I want everyone to be proficient in what they do. I hold myself to a high standard and I hope others hold themselves to the same standard. Working to save lives in the most tense moments earned Pinellas Park Fire's tactical medical team the title Special Operations Team of the Year. In addition to daily fire professional duties, these five men suit up, assisting police during SWAT operations. We are the medical element of that team. So we are there to protect not only the team, but anybody else who gets injured or hurt uh, in the line of duty. Providing medical care during calls like standoffs requires determination and a focused mindset. Their ability to work well together is important during critical calls. You get a bad trauma call, a shooting, an accident, you know, what have you, it's, you, you can't do it by yourself. If somebody's got multiple injuries or a serious injury, um, there's a lot of things that need to be done medically. Everybody starts to know and piece together um, what's to be expected um, and kind of anticipating the moves of, you know, what somebody else is going to be doing. We're also getting our game face on because um, it's, it, it's serious. The squad is close-knit and personifies the phrase, there's no I in team. Recently, this teamwork paid off during a call with a wounded person. They were able to save the patient and make it out of the incident safely. We can face a level of threat that ordinary paramedics off the street wouldn't be able to come into because we have the protection and we have the training to work directly with those operators. And so the best part is when we get to be there making that difference and potentially be the difference between life and death for somebody. The Board of County Commissioners congratulates these fire professionals of the year. And on behalf of the county, thank you to all the fire professionals in Pinellas for your service. I would like to ask the representatives from the Pinellas Federal Credit Union, Ms. Monica Lukasik, Marketing Specialist, and Mr. Ken Cameron, Vice President of Lending and Collections, to come forward and assist me with the presentation of the awards. They are always here every year and support this, and we are very pleased. Is Monica here? I'm here. I'm ready. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to call up Nicole McKeague. Um, the 911 telecommunicator 2 from Pinellas County's Regional 911 Center. Thank you for everything you do and your dedication over the many years. Would you like to say anything? Well, I'm just honored to receive the award and it's a group effort with everybody involved start to finish with every call. Okay.
Next, I'd like to call up firefighter and paramedic Alan Ahern from the Treasure Island Fire Rescue. And I want to come. The compassion you bestowed upon a homeless individual will always be remembered. Thank you for everything that you do every day. So, would you like to say anything? Yes, please. Okay. I'd like to recognize Donna Misiewicz from Hospice Empath. She was uh, instrumental in getting a young homeless man into hospice to die with dignity and comfort. And she was instrumental in that. And in, our country has a serious mental health and addiction problem that's not fully being addressed. And that means you and I become face to face with it every day. And that's an opportunity for us to do something do something for one person, do one thing, and it will make a difference. And that's all we can do because that's all we have. Thank you. And now uh, we'd like to ask the Pinellas Park Fire Department SWAT team to come up. Lieutenant Brian Davies, who's the SWAT medic team leader, firefighter and paramedic Kenny Hortis, who is also the alternate SWAT medic team leader, firefighter and paramedic Jared Nestor, and firefighter and emergency medical technician Chris Huffman, and last but not least, Tyler Coates, firefighter and paramedic. Um, I want to thank you for all the hard work you do all the time, especially during the SWAT ac activations, and for the medical support you provide to the Pinellas Park Police SWAT team. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Sure. Lieutenant Brian Davies. Paramedic Tyler Coates. Firefighter EMT Chris Huffman. And firefighter paramedic Jared Nestor. Ken Wirt has regretfully couldn't be here. He's in, uh, on vacation in Georgia. Chief Hayward? Come on down, Chief. Chief. Marty, grab the gas. Come on up. Grab those up. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Make this one work. Okay. Sideways. 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 Sideways.
Congratulations, guys. Congratulations. He did. Thank you. Park was well represented. And that's you. You've got most of the city, right? I have the whole city. Well, they annexed in. we got a couple of blocks. Oh, okay. yeah. oh. <laughs> They're on the hall. <laughs> yeah, I have the uh, Very courteous. I'm Seminole. The beach is Terre Verde. And then I get Feather Sound down to 22nd Avenue. Thank you. So from the interstate owners, I do remember all of that. Well, you're going to have a chance to redraw those. Yes, I know. <laughs> Our new commission that. Okay, next I'd like to introduce our own Commissioner Charlie Justice, who has a pure Pinellas presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before we came this afternoon, Commissioner Welch and I were at the Downtown St. Pete Partnership Luncheon, and one of the speakers was the new Executive Director of the Florida Orchestra, and he was talking about as a community of the arts, a lot of time people say we're lucky to have the orchestra, we're lucky to have arts, and he was making the point that a community like ours, we shouldn't say that anymore. We should say we deserve to have the art and the music and the culture that we have in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County. And so today, uh, to continue that theme of one more thing about Pure Pinellas, about something that is arts and culture and music, uh, very happy to introduce uh, someone who's been a friend of mine for over two decades, who is a banker by day, but uh, on his other time, he gets the, uh, the joy of sharing the gift of opera with us. And so I'd like to introduce and come on up, Mr. Remus Karnavishas, who will uh, tell us a little bit about what he does. Well, thank you. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Um, yes, I am a bank mortgage banker by day, and I sing with the St. Petersburg Opera Company at night. And it's a wonderful organization, and especially excited because in uh, November 18th and 19th, we are presenting a children's opera, Pinocchio. And what we do in conjunction with the uh, Pinellas County School System and the Florida Suncoast Opera Guild, we will bus in between 600 and 650 children to Opera Central, third graders from primarily Title I um, low-income schools, and we do these performances for them. There'll be four for them and then three for the general public. And for so many of these children, this is their first opportunity to see live theater. And I will tell you that that's, it's just, there's nothing like seeing the kids just go nuts over the first time they've ever seen something live. And so what I wanted to do is to sing a little excerpt from that, although I lost most of my audience just a little while ago. <laughs> but um, this excerpt, I play, I get to play the bad guy in this. I get to play the evil and pompous Dr. Dulcamara. And Dr. Dulcamara is a puppet master, and what he wants to do is to kidnap Pinocchio for the purpose of putting Pinocchio in his puppet show. And so um, I ask that you uh, put on your imaginary hats that there is a mechanical doll here because what in this opening scene, Dr. Dolkamara introduces himself and then um, talks about his latest acquisition, which is a mechanical doll that all you have to do is wind her up and she'll sing all day. And this is uh, Dr. Dolkamara. <clears throat> I thank you and greet you good County folk, now give me your attention. I am quite certain you've heard of me and know that I am famous. My skill and reputation are known throughout the nation. I'm Dr. Dulcamara, 
the famous puppet master. I will thrill and astound you. It makes me very happy just to be near you. Her beauty is so radiant, it's positively blinding. And furthermore, she'll sing all day without a single winding. A miracle of science, she will do most anything. And now we'll hear a song about the birdies in the spring. I'll press a little button and then she'll begin to sing. I'll press this little button and then she'll begin to sing. And if you want to hear more, you'll have to buy a ticket. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I, I just wanted to say one thing that's, that's a side benefit of singing with the opera company. I mean, I'm, I'm in my 60s, and with the opera company, you get to sing with young artists that are in their 20s, their 30s, and their 40s and 50s. You get to hang out with and share a wonderful experience with people like this. And the added benefit of that for me has been that I feel a lot better about our future <laughs> and where we're going because I got to know these folks, folks that I normally would not hang out with in you know, regular day-to-day -day life. So it's just been a blessed experience. And we thank everybody for the support for the opera company. Oh my gosh, that was awesome. What a great <laughs> teaser for us, all of us. Thank you. Sign up and come see your performance. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Madam Chair, where, where is the performance going to be at? It's going to be at Opera Central, which is at 2145 First Avenue South. It's in the Grand Central District of St. Petersburg. There's an opera building there that actually has a facility that seats up to 250 people. Oh, okay. And I would be glad to forward information to, uh, to Commissioner Justice That'd be great. to pass great. that around. But it, it's just a Great, great program, but again, we get to go out to the schools as well and do a promotional to the kids, and they're, they've never seen anything like it before, so it's just a great, great joy. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Any for other questions? Or, we good? Okay. Guess. Thank you. Just want to say thank you, Rem. We appreciate uh, oh, sure. coming up, sharing your time and talent with us. Thanks, Commissioner. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, we are now in, at Citizens to be Heard, and uh, Lenore Faulkner. Good afternoon, Commissioner Seal and your distinguished commission. Thank you for your service. I'm Lenore Faulkner from Madeira Beach, fighting for education excellence especially for middle schools and the precious students in the five schools in St. Petersburg. I was born at the U.S. Naval Academy 73 years ago. That is my model of education excellence. It does not change. Pensacola Catholic High is my alma mater for God and country. One year, 100% went on to higher education. Selfless love and public service was ingrained in us. Our principal has been there since 1988, 31 years. It is amazing the moving and shaking in Florida's public schools. When professional educators are replaced with uh, new instant educators in five poor elementary schools in the South St. Pete, what is the result? Five of the worst failing schools in the state of Florida. The school board says no problem. You need to look up the school board of 2007. They all won the Pulitzer Prize. I don't think they put it in their resume. Their schools were called failure factories. Where our Congress, when our Congresswoman brings the Secretary of Education from Washington, D.C., who orders an FBI investigation, there is a problem. I graduated from the number seven public university in 1967, the University of Florida. Uh, I taught eighth grade chemistry at Pinellas Park Middle for many years. Because of the mold and mildew of the middle schools, I could not breathe through my nose for many years. Lack of oxygen is a major cause of cancer. In 1999, I had cancer in seven of my lymph nodes. On the internet, it is 100% fatal. However, Morton Plant became uh, in a clinical trial out of Memphis. My white blood cells were killed, and I was home for five days without white blood cells. The other patients mostly died and were not as fortunate. My oncology doctor returned 
I retired, the oncology nurse retired, and my stem cell nurse moved to Pennsylvania. In 2003, I taught my last IMAS class. It was the Seven Habits of Highly Effective Buccaneers. My classroom was papered. In February of 2003, my allergy doctor wrote a letter for me to retire immediately because of the toxic conditions of my school. Uh, the school board hasn't responded yet. I speak at the school board meetings. I spoke this morning. I spend my time researching the corporate takeover of public education. My research will be sent to the president of the University of Florida soon. Uh, my dad was a Hellcat fighter pilot. He fought for public schools, not what we have now. Thank you. God bless you all. And Commissioner Justice, thank you for all that. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate it. Next is James Stott on the TNR issue, and thereafter, Phil Edwards. Mr. Phil Edwards on the same issue. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Stott. I also go by Mike, if you know me from the social circles. Um, I'm here to talk about the trap, neuter, and reabandon um, proposal that's on, on the table. I'm not going to go into the environmental side. I'm sure you've already heard a lot of that. Um, I could go on and on. Recently, three billion birds decrease in our population. Not a good thing. Cats have a lot to contribute to that. I'd like to t focus more on risk management. That's, a, that's been the subject of my life for almost well, my adult life. Uh, I've been in corporate banking, I've been in investment banking, I've been in mortgage services and, and investment services. I held my securities license, I've held my insurance license, mortgage broker's license, I'm still a CPA. In the last 24 years, I've been doing my risk management in the Bay Area in the real estate for my own accord. Um, I don't see where this proposal is an unrisky proposal. If we take these cats and make them property of the county, we are also subject, we, I mean as the taxpayers, are subject to their actions. Nuisance claims from property owners that don't get to enjoy their constitutional <laughs> right to quiet enjoyment of their property. I've been there. You can look me up. I used to live at 1130 36th Avenue North. You'll see me in animal services, cat marking my car. I don't want to deal with that. You guys were the ones that helped me out there. So we go from that. What about the claims of slip and fall? Somebody's riding their bike down the Pinellas Trail, a cat goes out in front of them, they get hurt. That cat is chipped, part of our Pinellas County inventory. Who are they going to sue? Lastly, toxoplasmosis. You ever hear the word? It's a disease carried by cats, cannot be vaccinated out of the cats. It's why they warn pregnant mothers to not handle the, the litter box. It causes birth defects and or can kill. My question, how are we going to mitigate those risks? And in that last one, how are these cats more important than our children? How are we going to mitigate these risks? And the only way I see that, in my experience, is to vote no. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Edwards? Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I previously sent an email that had a letter from me asking you not to allow Pinellas County Animal Services to change their policy. Uh, according to what I've been told, the commission, the regulations already allow them to do this. I'm asking you to stop this. I'm asking you to reverse course. Feral cats are not only a danger to birds, not only a danger, as Mr. Stott said, they ruin your enjoyment of your property. If you have a rock garden near your door or near your lanai, they pee in it. The odor is unbearable. I heard of a woman, I heard a young, an older woman say that um, she can no longer enjoy her home because the cats are climbing and tearing the screens. Okay? The, the odor of cat urine is so strong she can't even go out there. Pinellas County Animal Services says this is a best practice to re-abandon, as he said, these cats to their neighborhood. It's a best practice to keep from euthanizing cats. It's not a best practice to reduce the feral cat population. Not at all. Um, it's really also unfair to people who adopt cats 
responsibly. Because according to the website of Pinellas County Animal Services, those people have to keep their cats indoors. And if they take them out off their property, they have to walk them with a leash. But the person who just wants to start feeding cats next door to you or in your neighborhood can just feed cats and can have 20 to 30 of them. And if you don't think that happens, you need to listen to some of the people who've experienced this. And Pinellas County Animal Service is saying, if you'll call us about this, we'll go over and train these people how to be cat feeders responsibly. But they won't take the cats. <clears throat> Last, a couple things about numbers, population. Right now, Pinellas County Animal Services receives about 6,000 cats per year. The majority of those cats are adopted out. 2,000 of them are unadoptable and they're euthanized, okay? Now, if you think I hate animals, I don't. One of the most painful things I ever had to do was put down my own pet, but 2,000 of them. So you're talking about taking these 2,000 cats, putting them back on the street to give property owners a hard time. As I said, this is a not, not a best practice. This will not reduce the feral cat population for over 20 years, even if the population stays static. The last thing is, I put together a little set of calculations. I sent one to each of you when I came in. You may have it. Basically, the population, if we do nothing, is going to double in about four to five years. And then it'll double again in another four to five. So instead of letting PCAS do this, you need to stop it and you need to think how we're going to get control of this population. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. Okay, there are no other citizens to be heard. We will be discussing under county administrator reports later mm -hmm. the um, TNR issue. Um, moving on to the consent agenda, item 6 through 23rd. Does anyone wish to pull anything? Yeah, I just, uh, I'm pulling several just so we can just highlight them, not to really end up debating them, but 8 through 11. Um, 8 through 11? Yeah, 8 through 11, uh, 17 and 18. Just wanted uh, to take a moment that folks are here to be able to speak to what, uh, not, not the first four, I'm just going to make a comment about that, but the public works and utilities to talk a little bit briefly about the commitment uh, that we're making in each of those situations. Uh, one being a, a satellite office and the other continued uh, uh, emphasis on our infrastructure. So. Those, those, so those six um, instead items. of um, we'll go ahead and go through the items and then we'll do the consent agenda at the end of everything What's every so starting with the eight yeah eight through eleven I just really wanted to again um, let folks know that our um, uh, division of inspector general uh, here at the county uh, working at the through the clerk's office um, really is it has a great opportunity to investigate any of our organizations uh, throughout Pinellas County and do so. In this report, there are four, and uh, d different degrees of, uh, they can either substantiate the claims or unsubstantiate the claims or uh, uh, make, find them unfounded. But they do all this in accordance with principles and standards for the Office of Inspector General. So I think it just folks need to understand that we do a really good job here in the county of making sure we have the right people doing the right work all the time. But we also have an organization that's committed to making sure that that, uh, that it's always done that way. And if it's not, that they'll find out and uh, let us know through reports. So I think it's just a great addition. I just continue want to uh, uh, emphasize that and draw attention to the work that they do. So those are the first four all together. So. And then Item 17? Yeah, number 17, we have a North County Satellite Office, and I probably get a question a week as to what is going there and when is it ever going to be done. So I was hoping somebody might just briefly say what will be going on there and when it will be done so folks might understand. Andrew? Andrew's here. Oh, Andrew? Well, one of you. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> <laughs> Flip the coin. <laughs> Good afternoon, Paul Sacco, Director of Solid Waste. So this project is a little little different in that it's being funded by Solid Waste and includes a real estate management component on behalf of the tax collector 
and Public Works is actually doing the project management. So the project itself, um, the outcome is to produce a driving range for the tax collector um, and also would, uh, and that's Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday and Sundays it would be a collection site for hazardous waste, chemicals, and electronics. So you're looking at, this is the right one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that looked like I was, okay. Um, that's how I look. It's okay. <laughs> so we were moving down the road pretty hard on this, and FDOT kind of threw us a curveball in that they wanted to add some drainage lines uh, crossing the south southern portion or bo uh, boundary um, to connect for, for drainage. So with that, they're putting in some very, very large um, drainage structures, very deep in the ground, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 feet down. Um, and they really didn't have their design and whatnot done, so they got that complete. We're gonna do that as part of our project because we didn't wanna finish our project, go back in, rip all that up, and then have FDOT do their work. So we're gonna combine that in our project. That's, what be, that's what's before you today is the joint uh, partnership agreement for that uh, additional monies to go to the county's contractor to do that work. That work ex, um, extends the scope of this contract and also extends the schedule. The schedule was going to be April of 2020. This work will push the schedule to August of 2020. So we've worked with the tax collector. We did propose a alternate to kind of expedite things. I knew they had to work some things with the state to see if that would still meet their their driving course requirements, and I don't think all those things lined up. So they said to go ahead and proceed as what's before you today. So we will do all that we can to open up the northern half of the property for the tax collector as early as possible. The project completion right now is looking at August 2020. Thank you for that update. Um, it, sometimes I even, I mean, I always say we always work slow in government, but in, in, but so, this project I thought was supposed to be not that anybody said that, but we approved this thing probably two years, maybe three three years ago, and it just takes forever to, uh, to design, to fund, to bring it to fruition, and then another delay. So I just really wanted folks to understand what was going there and uh, that we're looking at August of next year yes, sir. as the tentative schedule. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thanks for the update, Paul. Okay. Thank you, Paul. It's in item 18. <clears throat> and the other is just, um, I just, you know, folks, understand that uh, when we say that we, we really infrastructure is right up there at the top of our, our sense of responsibilities here and that uh, there's a lot of money that goes into it. And I just thought maybe somebody could take a minute to just talk about this project, uh, what it is in its simplistic state, but also what the commitment is from this county to making sure that uh, water or other flows like it's supposed to. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Steve Salter, Operations Division Director. Uh, Megan's out of town this week, so I'm here for her today. So um, this is uh, part of a master plan that had started back in early 2000 to upgrade the water system infrastructure, starting with the Keller replacement that came online in 2014, moved to the North Booster Station. Logan Water Pumping Station has been replaced, and now Capri, Isle, Capri Station out on Treasure Island. Uh, replacing, there's a five million gallon storage tank there. Uh, it was commissioned in 1979, so it's been running fantastically for 40 years, and it's just now reached its 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 age of life. So uh, we're replacing it with a new uh, technology as far as electrical components. All the new pan, you know, new electrical components, pumps, motors. Um, upgrading the architecture on the outside, working with the city and the park, you know, working with the city and the park that they have there. So this is just another way that we, the, the purpose of this station is to maintain pressures on the beaches. As it come, comes down Gulf Boulevard, we have two 16-inch lines that go uh, come down south on Gulf Boulevard. And this is uh, fire protection. Uh, again, uh, improvement of the drinking water quality as it makes its way through there. Proper uh, auto, or new automation. Uh, technology to be able to turn these pumps on and off, uh, monitoring of the water quality with new monitoring stations. And again, this is just, uh, we expect another 40 years of uh, production out of this facility. And um, what else would you like to say? No, that's okay. good. And I just this one uh, little small pump station runs mm -hmm. about $6 million. So. It's a little <laughs> small pump station that can pump how many gallons of water a day? So we can yeah. push six million through there every day, every day, every day. Yeah. And uh, the residents depend on that pressure 
you know, and um, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. So, but that, that is amazing that uh, the cost of some of this is technology, and it's a big expense up front, but if you spread those costs out over the years, you know that it is a, a great a payback a number of years, but that's why it's a 20-year investment because it does take, or 30-year you know, investment because it does take that long. So $6 million is what the low bid came in at, um, but that will give us another 40 years of reliability, uh, redundancy, uh, and uh, again, water quality to maintain as we Yeah, and I really do appreciate the work you all are doing and also the fact that they, they, we're going through all of this uh, check through all our entire system, the pipes and everything else that uh, we have to depend on to, de to deliver that. Uh, okay on a day-to-day -day basis, but thank you for, for okay. highlighting that for and us. And this, this project will take about 540 days, and then w once this gets under construction, the, the station at St. Pete Beach on Gulf Beach is going to be the next one we'll be bringing to you and having a discussion on what is the future of that station down on uh, that pumping station. So okay. uh, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate thank your time. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, then I'll entertain a motion to approve consent agenda items 6 through 23rd. Move approval. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. <clears throat> Access unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 24, Mr. Administrator. Agenda item 24 is the airline operating and use agreement with Allegiant Air uh, for operation uh, at St. Pete Clearwater International Airport. This um, brings in approximately $14.2 million. This is a 49.5% increase over the previous agreement. And uh, Tom Julesbury is here to answer any questions regarding this, or we have several items regarding construction. Any questions for Tom? Yes. Yeah, um, again, just an opportunity, please, to talk a little bit about the airport, but also just to talk about the, the fee structure changes. Um, and if there's any additional language in here to talk about some of the operational challenges that we've had, and I know that your your noise abatement task force works real hard at that, but is there any more that has been talked about within that agreement? Certainly. Be glad to do Thank so. Thank you. Tom Jusbury, hey, Airport Director. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, we're very proud to bring this uh, agreement before you uh, today. Um, it does have a significant increase in value over the previous agreement. Um, the different uh, fees uh, and charges that we receive from the airlines, and specifically Allegiant, come in the form of fees from uh, uh, leasing or renting ticket counter space, office space, uh, landing fees, uh, parking fees, uh, passenger uh, uh, screening fees. So we've taken a look at those. Um, we have increased some of those uh, compared to the previous agreement. Um, some of the other things that are also codified in that, as you related to, is uh, noise abatement. Uh, even though our, no our noise maintenance program is voluntary, we do stress the importance of it. They have been a great uh, partner over the years to try to go ahead and reduce uh, some of the impacts of the noise on the community. Um, specifically, some of the uh, uh, compliance rates that we do monitor, and that's compliance with noise abatement procedures. We actually monitor the arrivals and departures to ensure that they're flying those procedures when they can. Certainly, there's times during weather or traffic that they're forced to basically land and depart directly. But uh, we have seen a, a great uh, increase in compliance. In 2018, uh, the compliance rate by the airlines was about 77 percent. We have achieved and increased that to 90 percent, 92 percent actually year to date. So there is an ongoing commitment from them. Uh, again, and that is uh, stated in the operating agreement, even though it's voluntary, we continue to work with them on that. Thank you. Those are the only questions I have. Okay. I just wanted to, and, and I just, just, I think it was of note that uh, revenues uh, will be about fourteen million dollars for that next five-year period, estimated versus okay. nine and a half for that's the previous correct. five. So I think yeah. it, and that's a result of those increased fees that we yeah. mentioned earlier. So congrats on that. Right. Good Thank job, you. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my sister and her husband actually jumped on a flight last weekend. They got a great deal, $150 round trip for two people. Uh, so they jumped on a flight. Great experience. And I was telling them how we were getting ready to renew the, the contract. And it was the same question I get every time I, I mention Allegiant. Or they go, well, is there room at the airport for more airlines? Are we getting other airlines? What's going on? Do we have capacity with how fast they're going? Yeah. And so what, what should I tell them? Sure. We certainly have a capacity to accommodate uh, additional flights and additional airlines. We're trying to go ahead and move in a direction where, you know, we're expanding to see the expansion that's going out to the terminal so we can continue to accommodate uh, more airlines. 
Um, we're in uh, continued discussions with, with various uh, airlines to try to go ahead and get additional service. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen overnight. It ha happens over a couple of years. Uh, we are encouraged that we will see uh, additional uh, traffic for airlines in the next couple of years. Um, we're also excited, too, that we have heard from Allegiant, not only that they continue to go ahead and look at increasing and adding cities, but also going into the international market, could potentially as soon as next year with flights into uh, Mexico and the Caribbean. So um, those, those opportunities as well in the future. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Warren. So uh, I just wanted to tell you that I, too, had an opportunity to take a legion. But the flight was unbelievably packed. And all I heard from all of my colleagues that were on the plane going up and coming back <coughs> is why on earth they, they only fly on Saturday and Wednesday? They need more flights going to Maine. Yeah, well, that's, that's sort of part of the, the, the scope. What they do is they try to capitalize on the leisure market. And they know the leisure market uh, is used to traveling on a Thursday, Saturdays, and coming back on Monday. So that's where they try to focus those flights. Now, if their demand is there, then they will give consideration to um, adding additional days of the week but it's all demand driven. Now there's certain cities where there's a larger demand, uh, for example, Asheville. Right mm -hmm. now we'll see uh, daily service, if not sometimes twice a day to those cities. But again, it, it depends on the, it's market driven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know how much more market driven it can be when you can't get a seat on the plane going or coming. Well, yeah, I, you know, without, without seeing that specific data, it could have been for maybe that uh, uh, specific time of the season, or maybe they, uh, they do increase it depending on, on the time of the year. Certainly this time from August and October, a lot of the flight schedule is reduced compared to what we see uh, year-round. Anyway, it was a great flight up okay. and a great flight back. Great to hear. Easy peasy. Good. Easy as pie, right? Yeah. There you go. Madam <laughs> sure. Chair. Tom, great job. It's amazing that we've gotten used to 2.2 million passengers. Um, one of the things about our new um, briefing, though, is that if it's not taped, then you can't go back and see it. So I haven't seen your discussion on this, and you probably talked about it. But the um, Gateway Express project, how is that going? How is it impacting you? How are you and your staff adjusting to that? Sure. Just to differentiate, of course, two projects. You have the Gateway Express project that FDOT is overseeing. And then we have a parking lot expansion project. Um, a lot of synergies there, um, even leading up to it in the design to make sure that uh, access in and out of the airport was not going to be inhibited. Uh, we have uh, regular construction meetings with the airport engineer that does meet with them. Um, honestly, it's been, it's been good up to this point. It's been working well. Uh, I think uh, as far as the part of the project that's happening in front of the airport is not uh, expediting as fast as they, they wanted to, so that may be a slower, but it's not going to have uh, a negative impact as far as, again, the egress and entrance in. Great. Great job by you and your Thank staff. You. I'd move approval if you need a motion. Second. I'll second. <clears throat> motion by um, Commissioner Welch and second by Commissioner Gerard. <clears throat> and congratulations Thank to you. you and your team. I appreciate that. And thank you. Okay, unanimous approval. Okay, agenda item 25. Agenda item 25 is a public transportation grant agreement with the Florida Department of Transportation for the rehabilitation of the terminal parking apron and conversion of runway 927 to a taxiway at the St. Pete Clearwater Airport. And I'll let Tom explain. Sure. Yeah, we are uh, glad to receive this $4.5 million grant, one that we had uh, worked on about uh, 45 uh, years ago. Um, and talk and, a little um, bit about specifically. Can they zone in on your photo so we can yeah. see the project, please? Okay. What you're looking at here, uh, the grant is used for two separate projects. The first one, if you take a look here, represents the uh, terminal apron. Uh, we have spent the past uh, five years replacing most of the asphalt on the a apron with uh, concrete. This will complete that project. There's three parking positions that are in uh, need of rehabilitation, and um, the asphalt will be milled off in those three parking positions and replaced with concrete. 
Now, the project to the north, about four or five years ago, uh, runway 927 was decommissioned, basically closed. The reason being is we have uh, two runways that provide the adequate wind coverage mm -hmm. to accommodate all arrivals and uh, departures. So because of that, the FAA is not willing to go ahead and participate in any type of grant funding to maintain that runway. So as a result, the uh, runway was decommissioned. We're going to go ahead and uh, uh, turn that into a taxiway. That will enable us to go ahead and provide uh, further access to the terminal apron. But also, it'll open up this area here, so in the future, we could go ahead and expand the apron to the north, and that will allow for further uh, terminal development to the north as well. Any questions? Okay, any questions? Motion approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Welch. Unanimous approval. Okay, agenda item 26. And agenda item 26 is a grant agreement with, uh, for federal assistance submission to the Federal Aviation Administration for the 2019 Capital Improvement Program uh, for St. Pete Clearwater International Airport and authority uh, for the chair to execute the agreement. Yeah, we're, um, we're proud to bring this to you. This is a big deal for the airport and for the county. Again, this is a $20 million grant. And uh, one thing that should be noted is about 11.5 million of that is discretionary. And discretionary funding is something that we compete against, against other airports throughout the nation, uh, trying to justify the project, uh, working with uh, the FAA at the state level and also in D.C. So um, to receive a discretionary grant of this size is the, the largest in the airport's history and, and one that we're certainly proud of. So the, um, the entire grant will go to fund the rehabilitation of our primary air carrier runway that's about just under 10,000 feet, the one that's predominantly used by our, our airlines. Um, they will resurface the, uh, again, taking the asphalt off, re replacing it, also redoing the lighting and the uh, safety shoulders associated with the runway. Uh, we're looking at the uh, project to go ahead, hopefully issue a notice to proceed in October, um, actual construction beginning later this year with a completion date in January of 2021. So the entire project will last about 15 months. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I don't know how you all have stayed operating in the terminal area during all of this that's been going <laughs> mm -hmm. on. It's just crazy out there. But how do you yeah. propose, how do they phase the, the large runway? Um, that's that's the, really the point. No, that's only. a good question. What they'll do is they will do that just in that, in phases, basically three different phases. We'll actually relocate the threshold, which is sort of the landing and the departure point on the runway, and short, temporarily shorten the length of the runway. We'll do that on the north end in phase one and do that on the south end in phase two. And then there'll be a period of time, the, the final phase, where we'll actually have to fully shut down that runway and utilize our secondary runway, which is runway 422. Uh, we've been working with the airlines to make sure that they can accommodate that runway to do so. Uh, we've worked with the engineers to stress that we need to minimize the amount of time that we use that runway because that runway is further to the further to the east. So initially they were looking at a period of 250 days uh, for the utilization of 422. We were able to get them down to about 139, so almost 50 percent reduction. So what we will do is at that point in time when we need to use that runway, we will do sort of a media campaign to educate the community, especially those people in Feather Sound and let them know this is a temporary condition. And that was even addressed in our meetings with the FAA that the FAA said, yes, you'll be able to utilize this for airlines, but again, only on a temporary basis. And that's, that was certainly the, the intent all along. So plenty long enough for all the Coast Guard planes and- Coast Guard and the airlines, wow. yes. That's great, well, great job. Congratulations you. to your team, you and your team. We got a great team. You know, as mentioned, as far as all the construction activity, I think we got about seventy-seven million dollars worth of projects going out there. Uh, we got a we got a great team that's able to manage that and keep it all going. So, thank you for the kind comments. Yeah. Thank you. Motion. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard. Second by Commissioner Long. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, it passes unanimously. And then agenda item 27, I believe, is a deferral. Yeah, we're asking that this be deferred until the FAA uh, grant is executed. 
Christian to defer? Do we need oh. who to defer? To date certain? Is that? You yeah. want a date certain? October eighth. October eighth. Okay. okay. Second. Um, Commissioner Gerard made the motion, and Commissioner Justice seconded it um, to defer to October eighth. Okay, passes unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 28. This is an Dr. Fog Martin here. Yes, <laughs> this is an agreement with the uh, medical examiner for professional services for the medical examiner's office and Pinellas County Forensic Laboratory in the amount of $6.1 million. Our vote screen is still locked on the last one. Yeah. What's that? Our vote screen is still locked on the last one. Yeah. We need to get a manual vote. And the next ones? We'll do it verbally then. I don't know. It's not there it goes. It's gone now. So <laughs> okay, who made the motion? Commissioner Peters? Peters? Yeah. And then hit down um, Commissioner Second. I don't think anybody Gerard did made the second. Um, the only thing I wanted to ask, um, and I don't need to have it now, but in the attachments, the only um, list of fees I found were just for Pasco County. It didn't include Pinellas, so. Um, hmm. Are you asking for that? <laughs> later. I mean, it, it can be provided later. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, the fee, there are no fees for Pinellas County. We bill it's Pasco County to get them to reimburse us for those for services. Okay. So that's the reason there aren't fees for Pinellas. Okay. Thank okay. you, Bill. That clarifies that. Okay. Um, it's already disappeared, but I think it passed unanimously. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Agenda item 29. This is a grant award from U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and this is for the assisted outpatient treatment services for individuals with serious mental illness. Uh, in the, it's a two-year, it's $997,160 for years two through four. I'm going to approve it. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peters and second by Commissioner Welch. Okay, that passes unanimously. Um, agenda item 30 is a new grant award. Um, Daisy, you and your team rock. <laughs> um, yes, and this is for years 20. This is uh, expanded access to quality substance abuse, dis um, uh, substance use disorder and mental health services. It's a, uh, for uh, uh, health care for homeless. And this grant is in the amount of 140000 Seven hundred and fifty dollars, and there's no match or cost sharing. Approval. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Peters. Okay, that passes unanimously. And then next, another agenda item thirty-one, another wonderful grant award. Thank you, Daisy, and your staff. <laughs> And, and this is the same through the Department of Health and Human Services. This uh, will provide one FTE licensed mental health clinician, psychiatric fee for services, and telehealth supplies. A grant is $167,000 with no match. Need approval. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Gerard. I think it was or Welch. 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 Sorry. I'm hearing it from both sides. So. Right. <clears throat> okay. Passes unanimously. Agenda item 32. This is an interlocal agreement with the Public Defender's Office for Jail Diversion, Juvenile Crossover Case Managers, a Therapist for the Ready for Life Program, and for an information technology position in the amount of $1.2 million. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peter, second by Commissioner Long. The only request I was going to make since um, this is, you know, we have been increasing funding for various programs and um, the public defender's office is certainly doing a great job, but I think when he, when they come to present their budget, mm. I would like a report on all of these different positions and what they are accomplishing because um, this is additional funding that we are providing to get some results. 
especially the Ready for Life. Yep. Yep. Everybody agree? Yes. Okay. All right. We. That's unanimous. Uh, agenda item 33. This is a local agency program agreement. Um, for with the Florida Department of Transportation for the 67th Avenue sidewalk improvement project. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Edgar, second by Commissioner Welch. Madam Chair. Yes. Just so you know, this, this will connect those west of 58th Street on 62nd Avenue, east of 58th Street, right up to the Wounded Warrior Abilities Ranch Park that we've talked about over the years. So. Oh, great. So it provides better access for the folks there. And I noticed that it includes related intersection improvements because I think at the work session the other day, someone said, boy, this seems like a large amount of money, but it's more than just the sidewalks. There. Audie's here if you have any specific questions on the project. Anybody have any? Questions? I just had one other question. Um, how are we doing between US 19 and 49th in terms of? We have Adi come up and, okay. and that way we can kind of address all the questions on the project. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You want to talk about 49? Just how are we doing in sidewalks? This is the western portion, but how are we doing between 19 and, and say 49? Uh, Ken Jacobs, uh, Public Works Transportation. Uh, we're working on a, a, a PD&E study for 62nd Avenue to determine what the configuration is going to be. Uh, that's supposed to go out to the public in the next uh, month or so uh, to get that input before we start the design. So we kind of took a step back on 62nd Avenue based on uh, more of a multimodal approach, uh, making sure that the, the pedestrians and bikes and, mm -hmm. and transit were accommodated. So that's, uh, we actually took a step back so we could take a better step forward. So that's where we're at with that one right now. You foresee us getting rid of the gutter, the ditches and going curb and gutter? Uh, yes. Uh, for the most part, it, it will uh, get rid of the bigger ditches that are along the road and uh, put the sidewalk in. And part of that's already funded with uh, additional grant money that you don't see here. Uh, okay. There's grant money tied to that project also. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any yes. other questions? We have an motion in a second? Yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Addie. Okay, pass this unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 34. This is a lease agreement with the state uh, uh, Florida Department of Juvenile Justice for space at 14549th uh, Street. Um, and again, I think we discussed this at the work session. They, uh, they provide direct cost services. So they provide for the janitorial and things like that. Andrew Pupke is here if you have any specific questions. Just a question. I mean, this has been around, this agreement has been in place for 25 years. So mm -hmm. somebody could just, again, just to refresh me a little bit on the, um, I guess, why it, this is all just uh, gratis. I mean, we're giving them rent free, we're giving them utilities free, maintenance free, janitorial, pest control, leasehold improvements, all of that uh, we do. Um, and they reimburse us for nothing. And just wondering the rationale behind it, the history behind it, um, and... Andrew, here, come on up. Good afternoon, Andrew Pupke, Administrative Services. Uh, when we embarked... I'm sorry. Uh, when we embarked on the uh, new lease and we did this because of the age of the lease. We could have done a renewal, uh, but because of the age of the lease and the need to update some of the provisions of the lease, we went ahead and did a new lease. Uh, I think we operated under the understanding that we were looking at this from a historical perspective, both parties, that under the 25-year lease, it was the same conditions that the county provided the space and paid for the utilities and leasehold improvements. Uh, we've since, through our research, understood that that's the way it is for the majority of the juvenile assessment centers throughout the state hmm. in the counties where they reside. Uh, to my knowledge, and Jewel can correct me, but I don't believe that that is statutory, uh, but that is what we've understood from the Department of Juvenile Justice uh, through our conversations with them. There is an expectation under one Florida statute that the screening and intake services are co-located and the other counties do likewise. They have county provided space that is 
in close proximity to their uh, corrections facilities or their courthouses. Okay. okay. So it's just the way we've always done it. Yes. And I'm not, this wasn't really more of a question for you, but I appreciate you giving me that historical, that historical perspective. I Certainly. So that brings me to another thought. Are you taking that into consideration, Barry, in your inventory of county properties that you're assessing? Because just because that's the way we've always done it doesn't mean that's the way we ought to keep doing it. Well, I think that would be a separate conversation regarding how we look at the um, spaces where we provide for outside agencies, and those are traditionally state agencies. That's certainly something we could look at. Probably the the, the scope of the rest of the space study would be outside of that scope because we kind of did that when we looked at the criminal justice uh, agencies and how they did their space consolidation. Mm -hmm. But that's something that we could certainly look at because I don't know how many are out there like that and what the history is and why, the, why they're there. So we could certainly do that. Well, just for kicks, I mean, there is a big state building right on the corner of Elmerton, the northwest corner of Elmerton and South Fort Harrison the Mary Grizzle building that not too long ago had a lot of vacancies in it and since it is and they take young little kids in there in their health and human services um, department because I used to work in that building and I used to see them okay. just FYI mm -hmm. you, I'm just looking at Commissioner Justice it's a, the from what Mr. Pupke was saying it's quite a distance from our Justice Center to be doing I having the juvenile you, assessment. Yeah. I, I only brought it up because there are young little kids that are being taken into that building. And just food for thought. Mr. Jordan. This lease is just for the assessment center, though, not for the detention center. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Which is also there. So they assess them and then they go into the detention center, which is pretty much attached. And one point of additional information is that uh, the Sheriff's Office does collect a fee for intake of juveniles. It's $84 per intake and that money comes to the Sheriff and then is uh, transferred, if that's the correct term, to the revenue account under the Board of County Commissioners. So that is paid for by the municipalities that uh, bring juveniles to the location. So there is an offset. It's not a direct appropriation, but there is an offset that is provided. So I'm assuming that in exchange for the facilities, the idea is that they're providing, the state providing a service to each county. So in return, I guess it's, a, we're, we provide the. That would be my understanding, yes. Sir. Yeah. Appreciate it, thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. Any further discussion or comments? Okay. <clears throat> Need a motion? Move approval. If we, Commissioner Gerard, is there second. a second? Oh, second sorry. by Commissioner Welch. Gotta be faster. Okay, passes unanimously. Um, moving on to agenda item 35. This is a Medicaid public emergency medical transport letter of agreement between Pinellas County Medical uh, Emergency Medical Services and the Agency for Healthcare Administration. This uh, this is a part participation and extension for the program via an intergovernmental transfer and the net revenue amount of two two point five million dollars. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Peters. Okay, pass this unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 36. Uh, we're also asking that this item be deferred uh, based upon the need uh, for uh, additional legal review. To a date certain? To, we don't have a date. Um, okay, well then. We'll just take a motion to defer. Um, so moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Peters. Okay, that passes unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 37, um, serving as emergency medical services authority. Uh, 
This is Advance um, Life Support First Responder Agreement with 16 municipalities and independent fire districts. Mm -hmm. This is a five-year term. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Gerard. Um, pass this unanimously, and I do want to note that I thought it was important in going back in history. Um, this is maintains 25% in our reserves, which was an important policy that we put into place to make sure that we are in sound budgetary um, circumstances. Good ones. Okay, uh, agenda item 38. This is the issuance of a certificate of public conveyance for a necessity for a non-medical wheelchair transport provider. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner <coughs> Peters. Okay, that's unanimous. Moving on to agenda item 39. This is T.R. Verde Advanced Life Support Responder Agreement with the uh, Lelman Special Fire uh, Control District. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Justice. Okay. Quick question. Yes. Was that a, uh, a, uh, a, a five-year renewal also? I'd this is a five-year. Um, elite five-year agreement and a five-year renewal? Now, this is just a five-year. It doesn't have a renewal period. This is a five-year agreement. And is that, is that that's similar to most of the other ones as well? The other ones have do have a five-year renewal. This one is specifically looking because there's some other issues that they want to address contractually, and so this gives them time to be able to address all those various things. Hmm. Okay. Well, I would like to have the consideration that others have and have the five-year renewal option in there as well. Is that a motion? I would I amend the motion. I don't, did anybody... I don't know if anybody made the motion or seconded it, but I would like to amend the motion, include that if it. I would second what it. is it? The, I, I'm, I'm not. I, I believe the county administrator said this is the recommendation of staff for particular right. reasons. Um, so I'd like to respect that. Um, so they're they're under a. Uh, they provide obviously. Um, uh, Loman Fire District provides services to Tierra Verde. There are some other structural changes that they could make regarding the way in which they um, provide that service. And there were some um, recent, le recent cases they said, that, uh, legally, we probably should go back and look at some different various options and, and structures. Um, and so I think the, the question is, those we don't know how long those are going to take time to, to occur. And so it gives them a time period to come back and address it. So I don't think they... They needed the 10-year period. They knew that they were going to bring back something prior to the, ex the termination of the five-year agreement. That's the reason they didn't ask for that extension. Who, uh, who's they? Both. I have a question. Um, so um, if it's an option, if they get a five-year option, would we still not have the ability to not renew that option at five years? So we can give it to them. And if that's the case, and the attorney is the nodding beat. yes. Okay, so it would be it would be for either party. It would be for either party. And so. it, it, the, the, any extension would be basically how we drafted it. More often than not, extent, contract extensions are based upon the mutual agreement of the two parties. So yes, it would be at our okay. discretion, plus, you know, plus the fire district's um, discretion as well. But generally, I mean, essentially, it depends on how it's drafted. We generally will draft extensions to be a mutual agreement of the two parties, and in writing, it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Um, I think um, the five and five, given that the county, if 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 the if the things that need to happen don't happen, and the county has the opportunity to opt out, I think doing a five plus five <laughs> gives the citizens in Tierra Verde a little more confidence um, in that we really are supporting Lelman to be their fire department, and that's what they're looking for, and so. As long as they the opportunity to opt out, I think that still respects staff, um, and it also respects the citizens that really are passionate about Lelman being their fire service. Commissioner Justice and Commissioner Long. And, and I'm fine with that. This was this is the five-year renewal on the original five years. So this was the second five of the first five. So this is that five-year option on the first five-year contract that we did in, I guess, 2014. 
Um, the only question I had is, is um, this has to be in place like midnight, September 30th. Are we able to make that kind of change um, on the fly today? Adam. That's, you know, and if we are, then I'm fine with it. Um, that's my only question. Commissioner? Sure? Well, I mean, I, I agree with you, Madam Chair, that we're making, this has come to us as a recommendation from the staff after having conversations with both parties and out of respect for their work and the work that they've done and also some of the other issues that are surfacing around the county, I would like to see us just go with what is in front of us today and we can work on, we can work on, I mean, there's not a question. Everything is settled right now with the exception of what's going on at Suncoast. Um, I hate to see us go off the radar here right now. Which is what everybody did agree to. So, Commissioner Welch? Yeah, I, I would lean that way as well. I'm happy to see the agreement that's in front of us. And um, I think Chief Graham has spoken with most of us, and he's here today if, if he you wanted to hear him weigh in but I think we're in a good place if we want to come back and add five years later we can always do that but I think we're in a good place well I, if, if that you know if this is the second five-year renewal and um, the amount of progress we've made in the last five years on this item it shouldn't be an issue right now so um, I either either we have an issue or we don't have an issue and uh, um, and I think there's enough thought uh, on either on either side and I think we're just kind of kicking the can down the road um, I'm comfortable with the the setup that we have with the with the Lelman fire department servicing that area others may not be that's fine that's why I'm comfortable with a five and a five year renewal because I think that's the way it should be and I think we have avenues to allow that to happen so that's just my opinion again that's why I'm comfortable with it but we hadn't made any progress in the last five years on taking care of this issue so I'm not quite sure what we're going to do in the next five years. So just just comment. And, and if I may, I've spoken to the citizens, and, and they're very nervous that yeah. we would take them away. And I just Why? think that we they haven't just done are, anything. It just it's just the perception within the community. It's their perception. Perception's reality to them. Um, and by giving them the five year, because they had heard the rumors that we were only going to do a one year in 18 months. And so they immediately got their backup because they're afraid that we're going to transfer that to another department. And so as long as we have the option to back out of it in five years, then at least we're letting the citizens know that they can trust us, they can count on us on our word, because that there is concern in the community. And so as long as we have the opportunity to back out, it doesn't really matter if you're giving them a five-year only and then they have to negotiate then, or if you're saying, oh, in five years you can have a renewal. But but the county can back out. It, it's really the same thing, except that it's lending a little more trust to the citizens is all it's doing. So I definitely would support that motion. And if I could interject, I think Commissioner Justice may have been the one that really brought to light one of the things that you all need to consider is that their agreement currently terminates the end of this month. You all could make a motion to modify this term today, but I see the chief getting up. He could probably speak to whether or not you would be changing the contract that's in front of you that the fire district has already approved. So it would need to go back to them for approval, which I assume would be forthcoming. I just don't know that there's another opportunity to get that done prior to September 30th. Next week. And, and Madam Chair. Since you've been patiently waiting. Fortunately, how you doing? Hi, Chief. Um, Fortunately, my commission has already approved the five-year the five-year extension, so you don't have to go back to them. They've already approved it. <laughs> Can you identify yourself, uh, Richard Graham, Fire Chief for Loman, Special Fire Control District. Um, so, and this is not a new, th this is a completely new contract, so this isn't an extension on the last one. The last one was the extension. It should have been. So, the, the issue is, staff's tried to take it away from us, not the staff, but staff's that tried to take it away from us three, four times over the last 10 years. We've been servicing out there for 10 years. The issue that just came up, we don't believe it's an issue. We have four legal opinions saying it's not an issue. We don't believe it's an issue. I get, you know, county attorneys do. So we're willing to work with the legislature to try to get that change. It's more of a clarification mm -hmm. than a real, and, and, I, and I get, you know, I'm not an attorney. Um, so at the end of the day, we're just trying to make it through. But, uh, but I, I think you're absolutely right. A five-year, with a five-year renewal, what's the difference? 
but that just means we don't have to come back here in five years and then try to get another extension. And so Chief, you would have to do another contract in five years, to be clear. The renewals do require action of the right. board. And if I can make a couple points. The one, absolutely the citizens are thrilled with the service that they're receiving now uh, versus what they had pre previously. Uh, the, the staffing out there has been incredible as far as connecting the community and servicing and bringing their needs forward to us so that we fund it appropriately. Um, if we can legally find a way to do the five and five, we could do a 20 year because in the contract we have a 90 day or 45 day or something like that if something arose to the point where yeah. we wanted to get out of it. So um, if we were able to do it with some kind of conditional with a five and five, which is standard, I'm fully supportive of doing that today. But I just want to make sure that we're not going to do something that bogs us down to where come October 1st, we're kind of in limbo. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Long. Yes, Chief Graham. Yes, ma'am. I know you and I have a very long history. We do. And this commission is in such a different place today it is. than it was 10 years ago. And I wasn't even here 10 years ago. So my, my concern, I am really troubled by the comments that Commissioner Peters made that the residents on Tierra Verde, it's a trust issue. We haven't done anything to give them any concern for a trust issue, nor have, has the fire department. So, I mean, I'm a little frustrated with talking about what was going on 10 years ago because we've worked so hard to move away from that. Sure. Don't you agree? Uh, I, I do. And, and it you. wasn't you, but I'm just trying to answer the question of why well, there's, there's some mistrust there. Um, those staff members no longer work for the county. Um, well, from what folks. staff are you talking about? Our staff? Yes, yes. And there's different things that have happened during that during that 10 years that's that's why many of the Terra Verde residents are, are are nervous about that so we're just trying to get the five year the five year renewal like everybody else got and we'll work work towards getting that legislation changed updated the clarification I guess is what it's what it's actually going to be now um, and, and then we just keep doing business and and hopefully the county staff will be able to help us with that you know moving uh, forward mm -hmm. and and we've got we, we think we've got everything lined up so it should be should be moving forward you're right at, at the last and it does time flies it does at that five-year renewal right. there was the the previous previous administrator yeah at the two time, administrations uh, ago. two administrators ago did want to make it a two-year instead of a five-year right. and that's it's what oh, i know it's not me don't worry <laughs> <laughs> i'm here long enough to it's say previous removed. previous administrator now. <laughs> um and that's where there was a lot of, and I think, I guess that's, there's some residual feelings from that day, but again, that is that's quite a while ago. I mean, let, let's understand it. So regardless of how you do this contractual, it has to come back in five years. So, um, and that's from the county attorney's office. They're, they're asking for some clarification from the legislature to make very clear the, the ability to, to contract the, the way in which it's currently provided. That's the only question. There's no, been no discussion about any change into the structure of providing that service. Thank you. Okay. Let's be um, clear there, about there's that. There's been <laughs> yeah, very, that. very clear. There's been zero discussion about that. It's how do we effectuate the contractual relationship. That's it. Thank you, Barry, the way for the clarification. Thank you, Chief. So can we get a, a, a legal thought on what our ability to do today is? Right. Well, again, I mean, I, the Chief is representative that they approved the five plus five. Um, again, I wasn't at the meeting. I don't know what we have. I don't know whether they actually approved a contract with that type of language. But what I would suggest, if you all were to move in this manner, if you go to the prior agenda item where the other agreements are under 37, for instance, the Clearwater Agreement and has, has the language that we would be looking at in Section 801, which makes it clear that there's a five-year term plus. Which agenda item? Pardon me? It's agenda item 37, just to give you an idea of what the language might look like if you wanted to approve 5 plus 5. It's section 801 and just the Clearwater Agreement. There's the first one I pulled up. But it's essentially, if you all were to make that move today, what I would recommend is you reference that language since it's very clear. It's very clearly written there. The chief's representing that the district has already approved that. That would be my only 
legal concern is that the other party had agreed to that so that we do have yeah. a contract in place prior to the expiration on September 30th. Joel, are you talking about the sentence that says this agreement will also have the option for one additional five-year extension? Correct. Well, you that's don't have a problem with that, do you? No, absolutely not. No, that's what we were asking. No, and and my want. commentary is if you all are going to make this change here today, that you would specifically reference that language so that it's very clear what your what your intent is. And it's this, it's the, exactly the same language that's in the other agreements. I'm just, again, so, trying to point to you the section that addresses that. Commissioner Eggers made the motion. Is that something he's willing to? Yeah. No, I, that's, that's, that's what I'm looking for. And I would second that. Okay. So, Commissioner so Eggers, is the motion. Well, we have an original motion by Commissioner Peters. Peters yes. And seconded by Commissioner Justice. That's the original motion. We have a motion. Can we just we originally had a motion by Commissioner Ager. No, he was, that was an addition. Why don't we just amendment. withdraw all the emotions? Let's just clear the, Let's just start clear the ranks and start yeah. over again, <laughs> if you don't mind. Well, I would like to make the motion that we extend a five-year lease agreement uh, with a five-year renewal. And the language, um, I'm, I don't have it in front of me. It's but right here. Sure. Have that line. Okay, so this agreement also will have the option, well, that's what I just said, the agreement will also have the option for one additional five-year extension. A uh, motion made by Commissioner no, Eggers and a second by Commissioner Peters. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Welch. Can we have Jewel just read that Section 801? It's short. Just, I just want to have it read. Yeah. So we're I was all trying to find it myself. Pull it up. It's yeah. on, and for your reference, it's on page 35. The, the, the sentence is, this agreement Agenda will item 30, uh, 37. I but I'd like right. Jewel to read it in. The way the, the term in the actual contract itself would read, the initial term of this agreement shall be for five years, commencing October 1st, 2019, and ending at midnight September 30th, 2024, 20, unless, unless this agreement is earlier terminated as provided for herein in this agreement. The additional language would be, this agreement may be extended for an additional five-year period following the initial term, provided the parties mutually agree in writing to such extension, which is subject to authority and contractor approval prior to July 1st, 2024. References in this agreement to term shall include the initial term of this agreement and all extensions thereof. That's the language from the other provider agreements that would they would make it identical. Okay. So I have a question. You say that your authority already approved that. So you are not looking happen. at the agreement that we're looking at that, right now. They approved both. So they, they approved both. Okay. Hoping for the Just five year case. the five year renewal. Okay. Yes. All right. Just in case, right. Okay. Is everybody clear? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Chief Graham. Thank you. Um, all right, we're ready for a vote. Okay, you got your five and five. Uh, moving on to agenda item 40, I would assume that we will <laughs> add that language right up front. So it's five and five. No, that one, that one we only want to do two years. <laughs> <laughs> This is the Fire Fire um, Protection Services Agreement. So. Okay. Okay. Really, Charles? <laughs> for a motion? So moved. A motion to reflect the five and five, if that's what it takes. You're right. Okay. Commissioner second. Peters. Second. Motion, second by Commissioner Eggers. Um, <laughs> ready to go. Mr. Long? Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, passes unanimously. Now we move on to agenda item 41. This is a master fire protection services agreement with eight municipalities providing fire protection services in 10 fire districts. Move approval. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peter, second by Commissioner um, Gerard. Okay, hey, that passes unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 42. This is a resolution approving the early extension of the 2019 tax rolls. Move approval. We're still <laughs> locked up. Again. Commissioner Gerard, is there a second? Second. We're still locked up. Second We're by stuck. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah. I, Vote screen's still stuck. locked. 
I mean, yes, but I can't get out of there. We're them. all stuck. So. Oh, you are all? Yeah, okay. from the previous. Yep, you go. good. Got it. Approved unanimously. Moving on to County Attorney Agenda Item 43. And Item 43, I recommend you authorize the initiation of litigation in the referenced case. This matter relates to uh, activities concerning the placement of fill within the waters of county and alteration of mangroves. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Peters. Okay, that's unanimous. Moving on to agenda item 44. And item number 44, um, if I can give a little bit more information, I had an opportunity to speak with Commissioner Welch just Stop. prior to the meeting and wanted to answer some of his questions, which I think would be of interest to um, the commission as well. We're stuck. This is a case that uh, was investigated by your Office of Human Rights. Uh, the finding there was uh, housing discrimination on the basis of race. What occurred here, the facts that gave rise to this, <coughs> was a rental housing where an individual, an African-American man, was denied a lease based on a prior felony record. And HUD guidance, just for the benefit of everybody here, does say that while uh, a criminal background search could potentially uh, be a fair housing practice, uh, when it does have a disparate impact upon a protected group, uh, then you have to look further. And without going into the details of the analysis here, uh, there is a disparate impact on African American men because of the higher rates of incarceration that they experience in society. Uh, data supports that. So then the analysis, the constitutional analysis of housing discrimination then goes on to ask whether the housing provi provider has a substantial, legitimate, and non-discriminatory interest in applying that policy. And while generally looking at someone's criminal background could potentially meet that standard, there is uh, guidance from HUD that states when uh, there's no look into the facts that gave rise to the felony, the length of time that has transpired since that felony, and whether there is a legitimate basis to find it as a substantial danger to the other residents, that the housing provider in that instance has not met their burden of showing there is no less discriminatory manner to accomplish their motive. Um, and in this case, this gentleman, they did. They just simply said, if you have a felony record, we, that's all we will consider. You, you will not be considered for occupancy here. Where the gentleman had uh, a felony record that was about 20 years old, uh, no sort of, uh, no sort of in, you know, recognition of that length of time was given. And this is uh, consistent with HUD uh, with HUD guidance on the matter. So while you can look at a criminal background, uh, there are some factors that would play into um, whether or not it's considered uh, a, a legitimate and non-discriminatory way to look at your tenants. Uh, so that's that's some of where, uh, okay. um, so I do believe that you know your Office of Human Rights followed legitimate uh, guidance from HUD in this instance because again, it was just an across the board, no felony record without looking at what type of felony it was, how long ago it was, and whether, you know, it really did present a substantial danger. Um, so on that basis, um, I would recommend that you authorize us to initiate litigation in the case referenced there. Again, uh, finding of housing discrimination by your Office of Human Rights. Thank you for doing that uh, quick research, Jewel. I'd move approval. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Welch and second by Commissioner Justice. <clears throat> okay, pass this unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 45. Under item number 45, I am recommending that you approve staff's recommenda recommendation as set forth in the confidential memo of the state. No approval. approval. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. Okay, pass this unanimously. Do you have any other county attorney reports? I do not. Okay. 
County Administrator reports, agenda item 47. Item 47 is Carolyn from the evaluation. Uh, you asked that I place this back on the agenda closer to the one year um, anniversary of, of my hire and which is coming up here in October. And so we placed it back on the agenda for consideration. Any questions? No, you can't say I've only just been here now. That's right. right. A year. Um, I, I, I can't I believe lost, it's been a year. I, I lost my honeymoon period. I know. Um, <laughs> <It's over. laughs> I was hoping to hang on to it, but. Uh, but I just really just want to make a general comment that uh, Barry, I think you have gotten into the swing of things really quickly last year, and uh, have done a great job throughout the year um, on some tough issues that we've had to deal with, um, some expansion of, of uh, representation for unincorporated county folks, which I think is really a big deal, um, and just, just several other things that I think that you've done a great job. And I really appreciate being able to have dialogue with uh, your professional staff um, freely. It has been just wonderful, and it's just a, it's a great way for us to for us to learn, but also to have some some dis uh, discussion back and forth on critical issues for our residents. So, uh, for a lot of things that I haven't even mentioned, but thank you for a really good first year. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. It's been a great year, and um, I think I gave you probably the highest marks of anybody. I think you did. Well, you were closer with them than anybody <laughs> else. <laughs> Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Welch and second by Commissioner <laughs> Justice. With the change in the contract. Okay. Now that you're unanimous, okay, unanimous. I can speak because I did, you know, didn't want to didn't <laughs> jinx anything, you know. But, but I really do appreciate the, the vote of confidence by the commission. Um, it is really good to work with the commission that it truly works together well, works with staff well, has mutual respect for each other. Um, you don't find that a lot. And um, so, you know, tremendous, um, tremendous amount of support there, and that's how you get things done. So really appreciate that just as important. I've just found our staff to be second to none. Um, people that are really dedicated, want to do well, work together well, just trying to put, you know, get wake up every day and figure out how to do something that benefits people. And, and so um, to them, I just say thank you. And, uh, and I really, really appreciate working with all of them. Yeah. Um, with that, though, second part of my report is I'd, I'd ask Doug to come up and kind of outline the whole, the issue that you're mm -hmm. getting lots of um, mail about. <laughs> and so he can just kind of outline um, the issue, how it come about, what he's doing to bring it forward, and uh, kind of how this will play itself out. Hi, Doug. Hi, commissioners. Hi. Mr. Burton. Um, Doug Brightwell, Director for Animal Services. Um, and I can't see that, so hopefully you all can. Oh, there it is. Um, quickly, what we're talking about is a variation of TMVR, which is trap, neuter, vaccinate, release, which this commission approved in 2014 here in Pinellas County. Um, it's called RTF, return to field. This is not placing new cats or extra cats back in the community. This is strictly a subset of cats that come into our agency that currently are perfectly healthy and thriving when they came into us wherever they lived, but they're not getting reclaimed or adopted because of their usually feral behavior. So they're putting them, we, the proposal will be to put them back out after they're sterilized, vaccinated, under the TNR guidelines. Um, there are no ordinance changes required to do this. It's already legal under our current statute, our current ordinance 1437 for TMVR. Um, we held three public meetings together, feedback from the citizens. Um, varying viewpoints on all spectrums of this particular subject. We also gathered um, input via phone calls, emails, which many of y'all got, um, electri and two electronic surveys, which mar marketing and communication helped us out with. We're going to get that summary of feedback and input put together in the next couple of weeks, and then forward that to Mr. Burton's office um, for further conversation on this subject. And you ask why we are doing this. Um, quick explanation on that. Um, currently, those unadoptable healthy community cats or euthanized if they cannot be adopted or put by, or reclaimed by owners. That was the industry policy best practice 
for the last 50 to 60 years nationwide. Um, that best practice in the industry has shifted over the last decade. Um, so we're wanting to follow suit with what the industry is doing throughout the state of Florida and throughout the country, which is take those healthy community cats, put them back where they came from if they were already thriving, sterilized, rabies vaccinated, ear tipped and microchipped. We would not be putting them back if they're healthy, I mean if they're sick, if they're injured, if they're not already coming in healthy, we would not put them back. Um, also, we have some guidelines in the ordinance as far as parks, conservation areas, all of that, of a 150-yard boundary where the cats cannot reside legally. And we would not put any cats back within that boundary. Um, we had University of Florida Vet School Shelter Program come and evaluate our shelter and all of our programs back in May. And this was one of their top recommendations, too, is to get on board with the best practices on this issue. Um, and I did some research throughout the state. And the 15 largest counties in the state, except for us and Polk, have already implemented this at some point over the last decade. We're being a little different with the way we approach it. The other counties, a lot of them just implemented it and let commissioners deal with whatever happened. Of course, in Pinellas, we would like to be a little more transparent and try to educate people and inform people as to what is actually taking place versus what their perception may be. How do the cats arrive at the shelter? Are they being Sometimes, caught by our animal? Some, we don't do any active trapping. We stopped that five, okay. about five years ago. Um, we will pick them up from citizens who, fit, who catch them and citizens will bring them in. And one of the things we have changed in the last few months, for years when somebody brings in a stray dog, they will ask us what's gonna happen to the dog. We have a very honest conversation with that person. If the dog is aggressive or sick, we will be honest with them and tell them, if this dog stays here, we will euthanize that dog. And many people will choose not to leave the dog with us. We've never had that honest conversation with cats. For years, we've just taken them in and kind of glossed over what happens. And now that we've started having that same honest conversation with cats, in the last few months, we're seeing less cats being left with us for that very same reason which means those people don't want to leave them with us if it's guaranteed that they're not euthanized. These feral cats? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. So by euthanizing them and vaccinating them, you protect against rabies, and then you stop the litter of kittens mm -hmm. being born. Choose your words, not euthanizing. Sir? Sterilize. Uh, sterilize, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. You it, you have to, after euthanize. There's too many, too many similar words there. Too many items. Um, so we're following the recommendations of the industry and the University of Florida Vet School and what an industry best practice is. So how do you treat, you know, the two gentlemen that mm -hmm. were here today? So what kind of bubbled as an issue is that there may be areas in which they are a nuisance mm -hmm. to the neighborhood we and have, to individuals. And so maybe what if they bring them in? And well, then you return it back to their neighborhood. It's no different than owned cats who come in for the same public nuisance. The owner still gets to take them back. So we have, we've had ear tipping with TNR legal since 2014. We microchip a cat the first time it comes in and goes back out. So we identify that microchip, identifies that specific cat. For the purpose of public nuisance, we have a three strikes and you're out policy basically. So if a cat comes in the first time, it gets the microchip, goes back to where it came from comes back in a second time, meow now, we'll pick it up and take it back where it came from. If it comes in a third time, we do not allow that cat to be released. So on that third strike, they're out. And then since 2014, of all the cats we've microchipped that are already ear tipped, we've had three cats come back more than once. But again, let's say it's, you know, somebody who brings them in specifically because they're bothered by the behavior some of the conversations and, and we have with folks. That's kind of reaping. That's some almost of, unfair to them. You then return them back to their backyard again. Well, we're going to relocate them to the general area. They don't necessarily live in that backyard. Um, but many of the nuisance issues that people deal with are from the noise and the prowling and the breeding process and then the kittens that result from that. All of those diminish and disappear after the sterilization goes, is taken place because they can't breed they can't reproduce, and a lot of the noise affiliated with those cats is during the breeding process. But do you return them to basically the same area? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Within, usually within a block is the practice. 
So I have a question. So about that, if people are bringing them in because they're spraying in their yard, right. they bring them in three times because they sprayed in their yard. Is that a nuisance cat and well, that's, euthanized? Well, the third, third time that cat comes back to us, it's not leaving the building again. Um, so it, it would seem, because, I mean, I, I don't know how easy it is to catch these feral cats. Not easy. I have two of my own, so any of my comments are... Feral you know, cats? No, regular, regular cats that live at home, <laughs> and they'll go out. Um, and we still so, advocate that, by the way. Yeah. We still advocate that own yeah, cats but I just don't understand how we're ever going to get ahead of this if we're not out trying to capture these animals, ahead, uh, trying to capture them and do that process, because... For every one or two that you have in, there, you know, there's hundreds that aren't being yes. brought in. And, and the I don't know how we're ever going to get ahead of it. Well, so. current, the current practice of just killing them hasn't made a, any impact in the issue at all. Yeah. And the way I, we were explaining it in one of the meetings, if you say that a feral cat has one litter of kittens per year with an average litter of four kittens per litter, kittens have more than four kittens in a litter and usually two or three or four litters per year. Yeah. So if you put back 100 cats sterilized, that's 100, 400 kittens that will not be born to continue to accelerate the problem. And usually with cats who are feral, once they're living in an area where their food source is, they don't easily welcome new cats into that area. We've got folks who trap cats week after week after week because when you remove a cat from the food source, unless you eliminate the food source, new set of fats, cats are going to continue to move in. So it's a continuous cycle. And data has shown you leave the cat in place, sterilized, it prevents the new cats from moving in. And so at least you're stabilizing that one location. Okay. And making it a little better for that person. But, but that still doesn't answer the questions about the harm they do in the environment with the birds and stuff like that. We've read numerous studies on both sides of that issue and we reached out to FWC again during this conversation because they helped us establish the 150 yard um, boundary back in 2014 and they have they are aware of this current conversation and they have chosen not to give us any additional input on this conversation at this time. Well shame on them why are they doing that? They are the experts that we have to depend on. Well Okay, and, but... <laughs> and they are choosing, they don't have anything new to add to the conversation at this point. So, so one final question. One final question. The um, issue of, of handling the cat litter. Um, and I, you know, I had a niece that was pregnant and mm -hmm. couldn't do that. I didn't, I didn't realize that. But mm -hmm. are, those, are those real issues? If, I mean, unless you actually handle... I mean, what kind of issues are we talking about with it? Well, regard? to my knowledge, the health department has not notified of us, of a, us in the years I've been here, of any cases of toxoplasmosis in the environment related to cats. Okay. Or, or worse than that, that somebody's suffered from it. Correct. Okay. And but, so we have not been informed of anything. So it can to happen, but we haven't seen it happen. That's correct, yeah. sir. Okay. And it's, it could happen with your cat at home Understand. with your own litter yeah. box. So yeah. there's, no, there's no difference there. Okay. Thank you. Justice and then Commissioner Welch. So, just so that I'm trying to get my math right, if the cats that have come in that typically would have never left the building mm -hmm. now are being put back, how is that not more cats? Even though I, I understand that those cats won't create another litter. Yes, sir. But they were already existing but, in that location before they came to us. We're just putting them back where they came from. So the thought is that if you have a existing non-reproducing cat in the same environment, you won't get a new? Yes, sir. Okay. That's correct. That's what the studies through UF and those places show. I don't know how, I don't know how you ever catch up. Mr. Welch? <laughs> we haven't, we haven't seen it. Since we got coyotes, we haven't seen many cats. <laughs> and that is, that's a part of the life cycle as well. The okay. Mr. Welch? Yeah, always interesting when you come. <laughs> you know. My apologies. And I, I see both sides of it. You know, you, you don't want to euthanize all these hundreds or thousands of cats. But to the homeowner who was in the example the gentleman gave whose, you know, cats were spraying their house daily, mm -hmm. um, what, what advice would you give them? There are a number of mitigation strategies that you, we try to provide to homeowners about that. And 
Also studies show that once cats are sterilized, give it about two to three months, a lot of those nuisance behaviors do tend to diminish, including the roaming farther away from where their food source is or whoever their caretaker is. So you're gonna see some abatement in that over time. And do we provide kits for trapping these no, sir. cats? We so stopped running traps, to... yes sir. Okay. We stopped doing that several years ago. Okay. One final question. So with this, are we going to be putting out traps no, ourselves? Or just simply when people turn them in? Yes ma'am, Okay. that's correct. One final question, I'm yes. sorry. What kind of um, education do we provide people out there, I mean, whether they're willing to listen or not? That they're <laughs> Every interaction that we have, either in the shelter, on the phone, or in the field, our staff has that conversation trying to educate folks on. Keep your cat inside. Keep your cat inside if it's a known cat. Um, and then if you have feral cats in your neighborhood, a lot of times what we find, like one of the folks that came to one of our meetings, we have rules now for TNR, for community caregivers, that they have to follow about feeding requirements, guidelines, and all of that. And two of the pro folks that we met with who had the biggest problem, once they gave us their address, they were people who refused to follow, and we had been citing, citing them over and over, and some, one of these ladies has been fined thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. and, we're in and TNR organization Meow Now assists us, if they have a caregiver out there that's refusing to comply with the ordinance, refusing to sterilize, refusing to vaccinate, refusing to follow the feeding guidelines, they call us so that our enforcement staff can go out and start that process with them. And that's and, going to continue. And, and we're never going to do anything to, to reduce the population of coyotes. So they're out yes, there. So, the coyotes people are are letting, there to stay. so people are you're letting your cats out. There's some pretty nasty things that happen. That is correct. Um, just keep them inside. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Well, um, you I know you'll be coming back with the, uh, go back to the county administrator, but I do think, I don't know how you slightly change the policy, but I think when someone brings in a nuisance cat from their neighborhood and they have been having problems, I'm not sure that we should neuter, return them, and whatever, and make them t have to try to trap them three more times if they're nuisance cats. So I let you all think upon that, but I do think we need to be respectful to both sides and, you know, get a handle on the feral cat population, but also recognize if they've been a real problem in a neighborhood. So I'll let you all figure that out. <laughs> so and may I, may I ask just one more question? So is the feral cat population in Pinellas County diminishing or it's getting bigger? What do you think? We, it's not quantified either way. We have no idea because there's no way to find and count them. There's no way to? To find, to, to quantify how many are out there. We approximate um, probably a little under 200,000 countywide. How many? 200,000. 200,000. We have cities that don't have that many people in them. <laughs> right. But well, we have approximately 400,000 owned pets in the county. Cats and dogs. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Um, for what you do and to all of your staff as well. All right, next is the Youth Advisory Committee. Um, I'm passing out ballots plus also a spreadsheet. Can I ask a question on this one? Yes. I have a question on it. Mm -hmm. uh, one student is from Pinell's Technical College. Is that high school age? He's in high school and doing homeschooling. He's high school. Ashley's got the answer. He's enrolled in high school online. I need to come up. Sorry. He, that student is enrolled in high school online, and he's dual enrolled at Pinellas Technical okay. College. Thank you. Madam Chair, just a question. Did we, did we make an affirmative decision, yes or no, on whether we were going to appoint, and Commissioner Peters, um, all 32 with the expectation there would be some natural attrition down to the 25 or expand our, our ordinance or whatever? Did we make a decision or discussion on that, or, or are we choosing 25? I don't think we made a decision. <coughs> I don't recall a decision, but I wasn't here during the workshop, so 
unless she made a decision while I was gone. Well, we talked I, a lot I about it. I've done it at a workshop, so. If you all move to uh, appoint all of them, what I would just simply recommend is that you also vote to waive the, the okay. upper limit that's in your resolution. I know just from discussions with Ashley that this is something that um, they plan to take a look at throughout the year and potentially change the resolution and possibly the structure based on discussion more towards the end of the school year. And it, like, that also gives her the opportunity and, and Commissioner Peters to get some input from the students, uh -huh. you know, to see if we're going to rework the program, if there are other things we might want to look at as well, um, which I think is a good idea on a go forward. But I would suggest that if you want to appoint um, all of them and not just 25, that you also vote to just waive that upper limit in your resolution for purposes of this school year. And unless there's objections or there's a reason for worrying about the number, that would be my preference to do, because I do think there will be some natural, especially when you have this many, you will have some natural percentages that kind of fall off. Right. But is I don't, right? don't want to voice that upon, because um, it is work for the staff. Is it all right with you, Commissioner Peters? Um, well, I'll tell you, 32 is going to a large number when we do tours at facilities. Um, just when we had the open house, we had a hard time managing the number that showed up. Um, I agree there would be attrition. Our hope is to have a robust program that we won't have attrition. That's our goal is to really have kind of a leadership program very much like, you know, Pinellas has a leadership program and we're hopeful that that would eliminate it. Um, again, if the program gets that good, we're still going to have a problem with, you know, I don't know what your numbers were in the past if you always had 30 numbers, if you were less than 30 numbers. Um, we worked really hard to promote it. Um, I, I think it'll be challenging if we have more than 25, but I, I don't like saying, saying no to anybody either. Um, I know my staff would prefer 25, <laughs> but... Um, what would be the criteria, if I may ask, to eliminate? Well, you know, if we were to stick with 25, what I would recommend is that we make the seven that wouldn't make it um, alternates, and then if somebody drops off, an alternate would step in, and so then they get part of that. That would be my recommend recommendation if you stick with what the resolution says on 25. If you all agree on 32, then we can all do 32. But If we're going to vote on 25, I think we're going to need about 100 more ballots. Right. Yeah. yeah I, 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 the, only, the, the only criteria that I've been able to come up with without, you know, sifting through every single application is that there are 22 who have no opportunity to be a, on youth advisory except through our through the county and there are there are 10 that have their opportunities in their city there are two from Dunedin two from Largo and six from St. Petersburg they all have youth advisory committees of their own the other 22 don't so if you're going to start looking at people with preference that's the only one I could come up with without and I don't really want to do that I would prefer doing what Commissioner Justice said if you want to call it 25 and 7 active alternates that's fine, but I mean, I, I don't really want to turn anybody away from this. This is just a great program, and uh, it's a little uncomfortable. I think that's okay. I, I don't think we're going to have to 32. I, I, you know, I mean, you have the experience of knowing how many fall off. You do so. have the experience. Well, so does Commissioner Justice. Um, I, we both saw considerable fall off because these are the kids that are busiest. They're very involved in their schools and. I think a lot of times they just underestimate how much time all those other things take. Um, I mean, they do get volunteer hours for this, but uh, there are plenty of other things they can do that take less time, I think. And the transportation sometimes becomes an issue. That's always um, an issue. My only suggestion is when we had an overabundance and we had over 40, <laughs> we had to come up with something that we recommended. And so we looked at the uh, spread in different age groups and uh, or different grade levels, took the people that had been there before just because they were usually seniors and only had one or two more years anyway. Um, the, Commissioner Justice is right. We'll be here all night if we have to vote and pick 25 of these. I would suggest that you all do that. Come up with a formula, mm -hmm. do that, and we'll, or we'll just... I we'll just wanted respect. to speak to or, it. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. appreciate because that. Because there's no way to consideration. Do it. Sure. No. Um, so a couple things to touch on there. Um, the bylaws do um, 
give preference to applicants who renew, and, and there are four of those. So we're obligated to do that. And, and right. like Commissioner Gerard said, they are upper classmen anyway. Oh, right. So, who um, are experienced, who right. are retreads. Okay. Yep. So, and then, and and we'll please correct anyway. me if I'm wrong here. These are kind of based on things that you and I have thrown back and forth. Since it's a Sunshine Committee, you could always, you know, it's publicly noticed, and any, uh, if you appointed 25, then the um, the seven who weren't selected as initial uh, or appointed as initial um, committee members could be in attendance as alternates. But in order to be um, a voting member of the committee, then basically an active committee member would have to drop off basically by choice or by um, violating the attendance policy exceeding two absences. So, um, so you all would have to have it on your BCC agenda to vote to remove one of the students and to add one of the students. Address that one too. So, um, so that could be awkward. Um, and I'm not tremendously opposed to adding seven, um, but next year if we get 50 applicants, then it's it's going to be a you know a different situation. Well, why don't you just take the first 25 that apply? Well, that's. We, and, and we could also, you know, like Commissioner Eggers has brought up with the unincorporated aspect. That's not a. A, a barrier to applying this year, but if we want to have the students um, kind of, you know, hear hear your That's feedback on, on making these difficult decisions, then the towards year. the end of the school year, we could bring them in and, and just talk about the uh, the actual structure of the committee and limiting yeah, it to good. unincorporated or municipalities who don't have a youth council. Can I address the? <clears throat> We've always we always treated this as their committee. They make the rules. They take the votes. I can tell you every year we had a problem. Every year we had a discussion about what do we do about people who don't show up. Mm -hmm. Never, ever, ever have they been willing to throw somebody out right. because they didn't show up. Mm. And so, but that it's their committee. So, so it, it wouldn't be an option to, um, to not remove somebody, right? Unless we were to waive some rules according to the resolution, then in order to have uh, to add a new voting member, you would have to vote to remove them. So if they historically don't want to do that, I wouldn't expect them to do it this year. Right. So if you want to raise it to 32, that's fine. But I think it's okay. I, I have no problem with you all picking seven to be alternates, like you said, and let them come. Sure. They'll, you know. they'll still get a great experience from it. You'll end up with less than twenty-five. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> I'll, I'll consider so that emotion. Minute, I just want to make sure I understand. I thought we were doing a twenty-five. The, the idea was twenty-five because it's too cumbersome. Now we're saying we're right. doing. No, we didn't uh, say twenty-five or too cumbersome. Sorry. We didn't say twenty-five or too cumbersome. Twenty-five. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm saying if we go, we go to thirty-two. But right now we're talking about twenty-five with seven alternates that can come and still have a. They may not vote, but they can still have a good time. Well, they're going to be there. It's so, still thirty-two. That are going around. So what I, I'm hearing, and I don't, I haven't heard from everybody. Is everybody agreeing that 32 is what it should be, or are we? What is your preference? Because I'm new at this, so I'm just going to go with what your preference Mr. is. Mr. Welch, I, I, I think we should go 32. I don't think there's a fair, and I'm glad to hear you say that that you could handle 32. But I do think we need some kind of structured way. Um, and I don't, I disagree with Commissioner Eggers on the unincorporated aspect. In my recollection, it was never supposed to be just for unincorporated. It was supposed to be for all the kids in the county mm -hmm. to experience and weigh in on county government. Well, that's, um, that, that's, I agree with that. That's yeah. why I said that those seven do get a chance. The seven that I mentioned, or the ten that I mentioned, do have a chance in their cities. There are many well, cities that don't have them. In their <laughs> cities, right. But this is supposed to give them an insight into county government, kind of like Fort Pinellas. And so I don't want us to say this the unincorporated should have priority because mm -hmm. it's supposed to give all kids, no matter where they live, their county residents, they should have input into county <coughs> government. Um, so I think we do need a more structured way to do it. I was kind of looking at the opposite. I, I added up, you know, which schools had the highest presence. Palm Harbor had 10, and there were several um, St. Pete Seminole, Richard Jacobson all had about three students each. So. If I were to go through a ballot, I'd be trying to make that more equal. That's um, what I was working on, too. So I just think we need a structure with it. Yeah, name, I guess. So I, I'd support 32 for today. Okay, so we had a motion for 25 and 7 alternates. Is there a substitute motion? 
Yeah, I will. Sure. You brought it up. I'll move that we appoint them all. I can guarantee you, and you can come back and tell me six months from now, that you will have less than 25 showing up on a regular basis. And, and could I suggest possibly your motion include a waiver? Of the upper limit? And a waiver of the upper limit in the just uh, for one year. That is for this one year. Is it an ordinance? I second just that. Resolution. Um, resolution. And, and, and I think you you brought up a good point. Maybe towards the end of the program, you can ask them how they would handle people, like how what we had to do this year, but how would they handle it going forward? Uh, kind of like Commissioner Welch said, where you'd spread it around all the schools, mm -hmm. um, right. or differently mm -hmm. you know so. because you know what happens if you have 50 applicants yeah. I mean we're gonna have to deal with it this at some point because right. um, yeah, nice you know problem. we great could. first challenge for the committee right right and I assume there exactly. have been some issues exactly. in the exactly I mean you're trying to teach them a bit about government and how those things work and how we pass it back to them and you all have had membership as low as 15 yeah. and as high as 35. So I assume that this has been an issue that's been discussed over the years. Over and over and over. Yes. Okay. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner Gerard, a second by Commissioner Eggers, and that is to um, adopt, I mean, to allow all 32 and to waive number in our um, resolution. Right, I'm like, no. I'm a yes, I don't have my okay. voting card. Here we go, unanimous. All right, very good. Okay, thank you. Um, next is um, appointment, reappointment to the Pinellas Public Library Cooperative. That's agenda item 49. Um, both um, current um, members, Karen and Lynn, have applied for reappointment, plus we're fortunate to also have Sally Everett um, apply as well. So what are the wishes of the board and bring ballots on this one? I have ballots. Oh, you did? <laughs> okay. Right. Great. Thank you. We have a ballot. So we'll go ahead and vote for two. How did you get a ballot? Mm. I don't know. Do I get it to me? Oh. I do want to know in Karen Ross' application, she noted that she is currently chair of the um, cooperative right now and oh. wanted to continue. You keep it, I don't want to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll move on to County Commission new business items. Uh, Commissioner Gerard, do you want to start? Yeah, with? I had sent out a memo about um, a request we got to issue a new resolution about the ERA because the people that have been working on this for decades are um, closer than they've ever been and are looking to push it over the top. I know that we did this many years ago, but frankly, nothing's changed, and it doesn't hurt to put our two cents in again, so. Is it necessary if we've already done it? I think they're looking for visible They need, visible it. They support need it at the now. state level. They need it at the state level. They've already got a record that the county's already done it, so I don't know why we have to do it I think they're looking again. for visible support right now. But don't they have Not visible support? 16 years ago. But the county hasn't done anything to rescind it like several states have. So it's still a good resolution, right? Sure it is. Just, just But I don't see any reason not to do it again since nothing's changed. And they still have, they haven't taken it up. 
Well, in it's true. Years. And several states have rescinded it, but I think as long as we got it on One state books, away from getting it. I know so. we are. I know we are. I'm not disagreeing with that. I just don't think it's, I don't know, I think it's silly, but fine. Well, it might be silly. Many of the things we do are silly. Many of the... <laughs> right? But they were asking, just like people ask us for proclamations all the time, they're asking for a resolution, and I told, told them I'd bring it to you, so... Madam Chair? Yes. So could we do something reaffirming... That's what I was wondering. Well, it's kind of what it... Yeah. what it is uh, we, we, we took a look and I did I call Brody on my staff took a look at this and we did draft something and, and I apologize we don't have copies here we the way it would be couched is in terms of referencing the resolution from 2003 and reaffirming the position taken in there support that I'm comfortable with that I didn't realize it was 16 years ago yeah. I know me me neither I mean Whitney did some good research. <laughs> but we could just do it every 10 years <laughs> until they do something, right? Maybe with the five and a five renewal. <laughs> well, yeah. Or five yeah, and there a, you go. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's good. May I have a motion, please? Well, move approval. Second. Move it forward. Reaffirm. Reaffirm. Okay. We have some language already. So. Okay. Um, and motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, oh, mine's not showing up. Here. Oh, I'm sorry. My fault. There we go. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I also mentioned the other day that I was going to bring up, um, we had a letter that was sent by Representative Ben Diamond that we were copied on on the USF issue, and I just wanted to see if you wanted me as chair to draft and send a similar letter I, I would make yes. motion that we ask you to do that okay yes ma'am all right it's very important consider it done thank you the USA. okay um, next yes. is County letter. Commission board is there anything else under new business for okay um, I will start with Commissioner Justice I'm gonna mix it up ah. yeah. all right um, really not much to report as far as committee updates, um, the uh, uh, Gulf Consortium will be meeting tomorrow uh, without me in Bay County. Um, and then uh, been able to attend some great community events. Uh, Commissioner Seal and I were at the 50th anniversary of the Bogusega Bay Aquatic Preserve establishment. <laughs> and I did not realize uh, the history involved until Thank I was you. there at that day. and. Uh, Representative, former state legislator Roger Wilson, uh, sponsored the legislation 50 years ago to create the Bogusega Aquatic Preserve, which was the first one in Florida. Now there are 41 aquatic preserves, so uh, landmark legislation to uh, protect uh, what we value here. Um, Habitat Builders Breakfast had a great crowd the other morning. They raised $100,000 to continue their mission. Um, had the chance to bring greetings from the commission to the Job Corps job fair Friday in St. Petersburg. They had uh, a lot of employers there looking to hire the Job Corps graduates, so it was a great day to, to see that excitement. Um, Saturday night, the Alpha House Butterfly Ball, which uh, raised money for helping uh, single mothers uh, move forward with their lives. Some great success, success stories shared there. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, Commissioner Walsh and I were at the Downtown Partnership Lunch uh, earlier today. So that is it for me. Okay, Commissioner Peters. Um, well, I attended the uh, AIRCO meeting last night, and um, again, I want to throw, shout out to the staff at the airport and, and Rena and the county staff. Mike Mydell was there, and they did a really good job. There was really good attendance. Um, there's still a lot of questions um, that have to be answered, but um, I was really impressed with the attendance, and the staff did a really great job. So, um, yeah, they're not in here, but Raheem, they did all you guys. They did a really good job. Um, and then I was in Minneapolis last week with the... Um, NACO and Gates Foundation Economic Mobility Program. Um, it was interesting. In Portland, I, I, what they showed us was really great because I think Pinellas County was doing everything they were doing but doing it better. In Minneapolis, I came back with a couple really good nuggets that I want to talk to Barry about. Um, I've already talked to Jill about some of them um, as far as 
uh, affordable housing and moving people up out of poverty. Um, and so I think they've got some really good ideas that I'll share with Barry. And hopefully maybe we can implement and you can learn a little bit more about them. But um, I was really impressed with what I learned there. So that's it. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, want to thank you for um, handling the census proclamation. I again want to thank our staff and team and uh, Kanan and Brian and so many of our staff are working as liaisons and our subcommittees are already out there working and we're doing a really good job. I was uh, glad to hear Constance Hill from the U.S. Census Bureau recognize what a great job our team is doing. And folks who I, I haven't even recognized like um, BTS or OTI with their website, all the interaction that they're doing to make it easy for folks to understand the census. It's just a really, really good uh, uh, job of teamwork. I wanted to thank uh, everyone who's working on that. I as well was in St. Paul, Minneapolis last week with the St. Pete Chamber uh, on their Thinking Outside the Berg. And this is the second time I've gone. The last one was in uh, to Raleigh in North Carolina. Um, about 50 business and community leaders uh, went on that trip. Uh, we had several ses sessions that focused on jobs and economic development. Housing, of course, was real huge. Uh, you may have read that they eliminated single-family housing. That's not quite what they did. They added some flexibility to what you can do with single-family housing. Um, I talked about equity, big emphasis on equity. On the second day, we took light rail and the green line from St. Paul West uh, to Minneapolis, went through the University of Minnesota. It was just so seamless. You know, there are students walking on both sides, light rails moving through. Uh, and we had lunch with representatives of the um, the Minnesota team and Dan Kennedy, who's the executive director of the Minnesota Sports Authority, uh, talked about their decade-long effort to get a new stadium. Uh, they ended up doing a 0.15 cent sales tax just by Hennepin County. The city did not participate. Uh, the team participated uh, and paid about a third of that stadium cost. Um, and again, it, it, it's built in a real tight framework. I think we talked about it uh, today with some folks that, that went on the trip. The solid waste facility is right next to the stadium. You basically oh can goodness. hit it with the baseball. Mm -hmm. And there's more <laughs> development going on all around it. And they estimated about 20%, which I thought was a low number, about 20% of the folks actually ride the light rail to the stadium. Um, so real interesting. We spoke with Mayor Jacob Fry on changes to their, their zoning code and their equity-based approach uh, to housing. And there were a lot of parallels. We talked with their equivalent, I think, of Ford Pinellas, Commissioner Eggers. And although they have light rail and all the other transportation, they still struggle for funding every year. And they still struggle with their legislature. They've decided to do more things at the county, local level because they continue to struggle with their legislator, legislature. Um, they haven't <laughs> come up with an answer to scooters there either. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, and like we uh, have here, they've got an affordable housing trust fund. They're looking at creative reuse. Uh, we looked at an area very much like the Warehouse Arts District where they're doing creative reuse uh, there as well. So a very good trip. Um, still trying to digest everything we learned, but I want to thank the St. Pete Chamber and everyone who went on that trip um, on how we can uh, move forward here. Uh, finally, um, our prayers and thoughts uh, go out to the family of uh, Jacquez Welch, the Northeast Viking you probably heard of. Uh, he was a key team captain who succumbed to what at the time was an unknown medical condition. Uh, he collapsed at the game uh, on Friday. I attended a, a um, a community gathering yesterday at Gateway Baptist Church. It was absolutely packed. Hundreds of students and, and coaches and, and folks who knew him. I, I went with my daughter. My daughter knew Jacquez in Northeast, and they used to joke that they're probably related down the line. Um, but I did not know him personally, but she did. Um, and judging by that turnout, a lot of folks thought of him very highly. Uh, he was just an exceptional young man. His mother, Marcia Nelson, spoke about his condition. Uh, he's a very strong uh, lady and, and the fact that he did have no brain function. Uh, and she mentioned uh, yesterday that last night they would make the honor walk. And that's the, you know, the walk that would culminate in him uh, donating seven organs. Oh my gosh. Uh, organs to seven people. Um, and it just showed that even in his death, how many folks he was reaching out and, and uplifting. 
And you probably know that the night of the game, uh, he presented a jersey to the family of another Northeast Vikings player, uh, Marquise Scott, uh, who had lost his life. And so it reminded me of what Commissioner Eggers talked about, about those moments and how things can change so quickly. Um, and uh, of course, our thoughts and prayers go out to, to his family, uh, to his mother, Marcia. Um, we're still trying to find out when the uh, service will be. Um, but he was an exceptional young man, 4.0 GPA, already had scholarships lined up uh, and was doing all the right things. And just we just reach out and, and put our arms around that family. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. That was very tragic. Absolutely. Um, Commissioner Long. That's so hard to follow, Commissioner Welch. It's such a tragedy. Um, well, okay, so our business technology services, you, those of you that serve on it probably know that the cybersecurity workshop is October 31st, and we want to make sure we're in attendance that that's going to be really, really important. Um, the recap from our meeting on August 23rd of T. Barta, um, it seemed like it happened so long ago, it's hard to remember where we ended up, but we are working on our budget for a next year. And you may remember that T. Barta a year ago had no money. And thanks to the interlocal memorandum with PSTA and the fine financial department that we have there, uh, T. Barta has now ended up the year with over $7 million in the bank. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So we are moving forward to fulfill the requirements by the legislature when they appropriated the dollars for us this year, and things are looking very good at T. Barta for our PD&E um, study that's going on right now for the 41-mile transit line that will connect our region all together. And the next board meeting for T. Barta is this coming Friday, September 27th. Um, PSTA, we just came back from D.C. and we're up there meeting with our congressional folks as well with the, as with the Federal Transit Administrator. All of the, all of the dominoes are lining up and we have a few little, um, asks of them that we need to comply with. One of them has to do with a contract that's needed between the county, Barry, and PSTA for the turnaround on St. Pete Beach. I'm not sure where we are with that. Working on it. Well, there's a deadline that we'd like to get that in by October 15th in order to get it up to the administrator in Washington. Yes, we're, we're aware of that. They're working to find that. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our second and final budget hearing for PSTA is tomorrow night at 6 p.m. For those of you that serve on it, please don't forget. I guess Commissioner Eggers will give the report on forward Pinellas since it's the first meeting that I have missed. I was away. Um, and the Regional Planning Council has now announced the first annual summit from our climate compact that we got signed a year ago. It's going to be January 7th through the 8th. The agenda that they've been working on is just a slam dunk, knock it out of the park. You may remember that our goal this year was to bring the business community to the compact because they are one group of stakeholders that had been left out. Uh, last the first year that we worked on it, so now they're um, they are going to be they are going to be presented at the summit with all of the things that one of the things they want to know is okay, well we're on board, but what is it you want us to do? And so during the summit, we'll be coming up with those metrics that the business community can do to really hit the ground running on the very important issue of climate change and sea level rise. And we also, because of the invitations that we've received from the international uh, folks that are working on this issue, we're going to be adding an international component to the summit agenda for folks 
um, that have already been here. Hank Ovink, for instance, from, who's their water czar at the, in the Netherlands, and some folks from Germany that have been working on this issue. So you'll hear a lot more of this um, as we move forward. I did have the uh, great pleasure of attending the ribbon cutting for Dr. Lori's um, new community center that we helped to help them to build on the campus of the Seminole College, and that was on September 10th, and it was very nicely attended by members of the community. And one of the most uh, awesome moments of the trip in D.C. was meeting with a woman by the name of Samantha Medlock, who's the senior advisor for the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. She is formally, the world is so small when you start moving around in it. She's a former employee at NOAA and knows our Hank Hode very well. So that was kind of a neat little connection that we made there. And she was very specific in mentioning the work that our county is doing on floodplain management and highlighted the quality of work coming from Mike Twitty's office. So kudos to Mike Twitty and his staff for all the work that they've done. And uh, as a result of a meeting I had earlier this morning with Hank, we're going to be meeting with a gentleman in downtown St. Petersburg who has a flood insurance company. And we're going to talk high-level issues with regards to the rates and truing up the rates for our citizens here in Florida. It was a very high-level discussion that I think we can make some real progress on in terms of our uh, land use and zoning issues and work that we do here on the county commission. So that led me to a conversation that I hope we can have, Commissioner Seal. I know you're term as chair is coming to an end, but sometime between now and the first of the year, or Commissioner Gerard, if it ends up on your watch, I hope that we can have a workshop on this issue of climate change and sea level rise and set a tone for we, where we go from now. I'm, I know that you know, and I've talked about it before, about the report that was done at the United Nations, as well as a report coming right out of the Trump administration on how Tampa Bay, and specifically Pinellas County, is the most vulnerable spot in the world for the issue of climate change and sea level rise for oh so many reasons. I don't want to take up too much time this afternoon to talk about it. But I do think that as we have an obligation on behalf of our citizens to be a real leader on this issue and to hit the ground running, I handed out to you this very short little speech that Greta Thornburg, who's only 16 years old, gave at the UN and spoke to Congress. It just so happened that while we were in Washington, she was there as well, and that movement with all the young people was taking place right as we were walking out of the Capitol one day. So it was incredibly exciting, and I surely hope that we're not going to be one of these people that she's speaking about in her comments that she's ashamed of because we're not putting any action behind our words. So um, I do think we have an incredible opportunity. And I'm going to just finalize my comments by telling you that, you know, for an example, the, the UN is having their climate summit right now in New York City. And wouldn't it be fabulous if one of our staff people was there representing us? The World uh, Convention on Climate Change is taking place in December in Chile. We should be there as an example. I know this is a big, broad, big visionary discussion, but if we're really serious about it, we have to take it very seriously and take action. 
the United Kingdom of the Netherlands has issued an, in, an official invitation to me to attend their International Water Week in Amsterdam the first week in November. It's so exciting to look at their agenda and see what they want to discuss. They have a small group of Floridians that they've invited who they want to learn from us and we want to learn from them what theories and what strategies we can put in place to mitigate against the rising sea. They've been doing it for centuries. The American Flood Coalition has invited the county to participate in the Florida Mayor's Summit on flooding and sea level rise in October. That again is in D.C. and Congressman Christ is a federal sponsor of the national program and he's right from our own backyard. I tell you all of this just to publicly acknowledge how excited I am that Barry has moved on this issue, hired our very own person, and it's nice to know that he is working with a coalition of resiliency folks from around our county so that we're not all duplicating each other's work. So I just know it's going to be an exciting year as we work on this issue, and we have a great opportunity to make a huge difference in the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I know I get really wound up, but. I think it would be timely before the end of the year to get um, an update from our new sustainability coordinator as well as the committee that's been working as one of uh, your reports. Sure. Before we, the end of the year. We, cer we certainly can. That's what they're working on is the plan. Right. <laughs> it's, you know, trying to get to get the assessment of what we've already done. I mean, we've done a lot of good work over the years and then setting a direction about where to go. And so they're, they've met once or twice, I think, Jill, maybe tw twice. Yeah. And so they, they've got some work to do. But we'll certainly target that towards the end of the year and try to get that report back to you. So I just have two more two more things, Commissioner Zeal, as it relates to this issue. I forgot to tell you that um, this this committee that Samantha is heading up has uh, they're working on a report which is due by March, and they've asked us as a county to weigh in on several of the questions that she's put together in a questionnaire, which I know. Doyle has already shared with Hank. Um, and I do think, and I was so tickled to see that our very own Representative Sprouls is not afraid to talk about climate change. And he's issued a mandate for his colleagues to not be afraid as well. And so maybe that's an opportunity for us to have a conversation with our state advocacy folks to discuss this at our joint meeting next week. Now I'm done. Thank we'll, you. We'll get you. I think the report will help clarify that a lot of the things that are being discussed, even nationally, we're already doing. We've already incorporated into our regulations. We've incorporated a lot. So getting that baseline assessment about where we're at and where we want to go is real important. That's what they're working on. So it'll be a good conversation. Okay. Your turn. Commissioner Eggers. Oh, <clears throat> thank you for your leadership on this, your your passion and uh, <laughs> your optimism. I mean, I think that's all important because I think this is a, this is a, a large topic that um, it's hard to put your arms around. It completely. is. But, if it uh, was easy, it would have been done 50 yeah. years ago. So I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Um, yeah, just real quickly on Forward Pinellas update, I think uh, Kim sent around yesterday our, our kind of our summary sheet on the board activity. So I think everybody can kind of get a sense of what's going on. I, I kind of touched on it last time uh, more talk about the metro quest survey that talked a lot about what folks in the area are looking for from transportation solutions um, they uh, we also had a presentation from the executive director talking about the funding options that are out there as we look at uh, transportation and transit so, uh, solutions to issues go going down the road so we had a, a presentation to the board on that um, many other things that were talked about, including um, on no November 4th, there's going to be a public engagement uh, in Palm Harbor to talk about a couple of things. The staff is, our staff is going to talk about the Palm Harbor downtown master plan. And FDOT is going to talk about roundabouts. And um, as you know, there's probably two being planned on 580 in Dunedin um, on Skinner Boulevard. Uh, um, 
Oh, this, this, that, that's going on separately, but we're going to have that on November 4th oh, that's what uh, at the, uh, at the high school. Uh, I think it's 5.30 to 7.30. Um, so they are, obviously they believe in them. Uh, they believe in uh, ones that uh, are not necessarily like Clearwater one, uh, more, uh, you know, single laned um, and that kind of thing. But anyway, there'll be a nice presentation and continuing to get more feedback from the pop, uh, from the public. So. Uh, PSTA um, uh, has has their next meeting, I guess, tomorrow uh, on the budget. And since I wasn't at the last meeting, I didn't hear whether or not. I know we couldn't raise the millage, but did we lower the millage at PSTA or did we leave it alone? I, no, I'm kidding. That was a joke. Um, so I, I'll be there tomorrow. To, we'll be discussing the budget a second time around. Um, and um, let's see, the, um, my VA community, uh, it's, a, it's the Community Veterans Engagement Board actually made up of a lot of residents from around the, the county that meets with the VA board, um, VA leadership. And we're t we talked a lot about Veterans Day activities in downtown St. Petersburg on November 8th and the, the role that the engagement board was going uh, is going to take. This engagement board's been around for about four years now and probably one of the first that was created in the country. Um, and has uh, got has really gotten some kudos around the country for the amount of work they're doing. And 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 Brett Miller, uh, a, a veteran himself, is the chair of that group and is doing a really good job of expanding that board and and, and bringing more uh, more people to the table. So really good work being done by them. Also, more discussion about the resource guide that the county <coughs> participates in creating. Um, uh, and working with a digital guide alongside of it. So we found out from a lot of our veterans, they like the, the one that they can put their hands on, but they also uh, want to learn more about how to engage with the digital guide. So Yellow, Yellow Ribbon Network is an organization that's working closely with our staff to, to incorporate what we have in the resource guide into that. So um, good work, uh, again, all to help out uh, the veterans uh, in, our, in our community. So. I uh, also just wanted to uh, say that uh, we don't have a Tampa Bay water meeting until October 21st. Um, TMA, um, I talked about that at the last meeting, but I did just want to give a shout out to um, our secretary, David Gwynn, uh, FDOT secretary, for the work that their group is doing. I really, I, I call it Tampa Bay Next. They call it Tampa Bay Next. I kind of uh, trying to learn more about it. But just so you know, they put together a, a guide that shows how many public engagements that they've been having mm -hmm. over the last few years uh, over in Tampa, Hillsborough County, and, in, and also now in, in Pinellas County on all of the work that's going on along I-275 from St. Obviously from the bridge in St. Petersburg all the way up through the town of, uh, through, through Tampa up, up, up to uh, Fowler Avenue. So um, I just really, he took some time to come over and kind of give you an update on some of the projects. And I just really wanted to thank him for that, uh, for that time. Um, and on just a couple of personal co uh, comments, I uh, wanted to thank uh, Daisy uh, for her uh, uh, Pinellas Veterans Coalition. We had a meeting, um, I guess it was Monday, um, and it was a coalition of people that uh, are involved in um, homelessness in Pinellas County as it relates to veterans. Um, the first meeting they had a month ago was relating to the suicide issues that our veterans face. Um, so. It's a coalition that we're building. I've been pushing for a veterans committee and, and staff said really wanted to try this veterans coalition group first. Um, I thought it was really great conversation. Uh, the only part that was missing are representatives from our veterans groups themselves. The veterans themselves uh, were at the table and I think we're gonna push to try to get some of those folks at the table to have conversation. Uh, with but a very good, uh, very good meeting and uh, a lot of a lot of energy in the room. Uh, uh, just a couple of uh, other things. Creative Pinellas is having a ribbon cutting. Um, Tampa, uh, it's in the under the overpass at McMullen Booth and Tampa Road or East Lake, however, right in that area. Underneath, they have a beautiful mural there, and they're going to have a ribbon cutting for that um, this Saturday at 10 o'clock. Is that right? 9:30. 9:30. Thank you. Um, and um, the um, Eliza Nelson Elementary School, as you know, there was an elementary school uh, that was reopened as a um, special special uh, s school up in uh, Palm Harbor, and it was renamed Eliza Nelson Elementary, and they're going to have tours on a uh, week from Saturday. 
uh, starting at 9 o'clock with a ceremony at 10 o'clock uh, honoring his daughter, um, the, excuse me, uh, Ms., uh, the do Eliza Nelson, who was uh, killed, uh, murdered, actually, when she was a very young child. Um, but anyway, uh, that, uh, that will be October 5th at 9 o'clock uh, ceremony at 10. And I um, want to just commend staff on continuing to work through trying to get ways for folks in Palm Harbor to get petitions signed and get golf carts uh, allowed on the east side of Alt-19 and still working through that whole process because it's so cumbersome. Um, at the same time, the city of Dunedin is, this Saturday is, is opening up almost up to two-thirds of their city to more golf karting. Uh, with ceremonial things that um, you know they have they have public outreach they have they get input from the residents um, and, and they make some decisions I this this uh, petition process is just very cumbersome as it relates to this kind of activity so I know that staff's looking at it and I hope we can uh, maybe adjust that a little bit and that's all I have thank you Commissioner Gerard. <laughs> In 30 seconds, I had a week full of budget hearings, PSTA, uh, Child Care License Board, Nellis Park Water Management District, um, Career Source had their budget issues. Um, <laughs> they talked about the change in the bylaws that we sent them, and we're not terribly happy that we unilaterally changed the bylaws and sent it to them, but they'll get over it. Um, and there were several people on the board that uh, explained as how that might that might be because there were issues and we're responsible and just be quiet, <laughs> basically. So that was good. Uh, yeah, actually, I didn't have to say it too much. Um, and I'm surprised Commissioner Long didn't talk about the ribbon cutting with uh, PSCA and um, oh the Greyhound the bus. Greyhound bus God, system. Just, well, we have a thank new. You. We have a new, uh, what do you call that? Partnership. Partnership <coughs> in Ellis Park where you can catch a Greyhound bus from the uh, PSTA lay-by at Pinellas Park Mall. Go all over the country. To all over the country, exactly. right. Correct. Well, that's Perfect. it for me. All right. Thank you. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Thank you. 30 seconds. Um, I have just a couple of things. One is I thought while Jake was in the audience, when we were at the Boca Siega um, Aquatic Preserve, someone came up to me and said, oh, the Florida Birding and Nature Festival is still going on. And we started this back in 2003-ish, I think. Well, so anyway, they used the same logo and everything, wow. and they took over our birding festival, and they're um, having it October 17th through the 20th. So I'll leave the um, information where we do the proclamations if you want to see it. Um, also, we, um, the Office of Human Rights, I just uh, will also leave this memo for you all from Paul Valente, but um, just some highlights. They... Their expected federal revenue is almost 370000 and it's the highest level of federal reimbursement for work done um, with HUD and EEOC since um, he's been leading this department for the last, um, the next best year over the last six years. The wage theft program uh, continues to be very successful and totals from 2016 to 2019 year to date, unpaid wages claimed um, 1.3 million, wages awarded 625,000, um, actual wages paid out 347,000. So I have metrics report from him to share, and um, they he also reported staff continues to meet HUD standard of closing at least 50% of all complaints of housing discrimination within 100 days, <coughs> which is great. And then they have started to do implicit unconscious bias training across several appointing authorities and been in getting good um, compliments about this program back. So I'll leave that information for you. Um, at JWB meeting yesterday, we approved the budget, and that was our second trim hearing. Um, I've got details as to that budget. Um, we also approved 
um, and children's literacy community outreach funding recommendation. Originally, it was going to be split among many agencies, and it was decided to award it just to the R Club. Okay. And then um, the second piece of that is the children's literacy instruction and maintenance funding recommendations, totaling about $1.1 million. The YMCA of St. Petersburg, um, a new organization called the Shirley Proctor Puller <coughs> Foundation, and Boys and Girls Club. So I've got a map of where that'll be served, and again, I'll put that out for you all if you wish to look at it. Um, so at this point, um, Jeanette, do we have the votes? Yes, Madam Chair. This is regarding item 49, um, regarding the appointment or reappointment to the Pinellas Public Library Co-op. Um, I have six votes for Karen Roth, six votes for Lynn E. I hope I don't say her name incorrectly, Femali, and two votes for Sarah Everett. Okay, great. If I do want to just send a message out to um, Sally Everett, um, please apply again. I mean, you would, she'd be an excellent um, member and understands government. Um, but I think it was great to reappoint those that are serving since they've been doing a good job. So, okay, let me see if there's anything else. Um, I see David Ballard Geddes is here, but um, Citizens to be Heard was moved. And unless you um, feel that you would like to speak at this point, we'll. Okay. Um, so we'll uh, hopefully see you next time. Thank you for your understanding. Um, and with that, we are um, adjourned until 6 o'clock.